nine. Ignition sequence. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Just one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. One, zero, and lift off. And mission complete, Houston. After uh, serving the world for over 30 years, the space shuttle turned its place in history and it's come to a final stop. Ja, die Gewalt zwischen Israel und den Palästinensern hat einen neuen Höhepunkt erreicht. Die Angst vor einem Flächenbrand im Nahen Osten wächst. Am frühen Abend ist nach Armeeangaben eine Rakete in der Nähe von Tel Aviv eingeschlagen. Einen Tag nach der gezielten Tötung des Hamas-Militärchefs hatte Israel seine Angriffe auf den Gazastreifen heute in unverminderter Härte fortgesetzt. Von dort aus wiederum schossen Extremisten weiter Raketen Richtung Israel. Bei den Kämpfen starben bereits mindestens 18 Menschen. Aus Israel berichtet unsere Nahostkorrespondentin Rachel Blufab. Der Horror ist zurück in Israel. Diese Soldatin in Kiryat Malachi ist am Ende ihrer Kräfte und der Beschuss aus Gaza geht unvermindert weiter. Kurz zuvor war dieses vierstöckige Wohnhaus getroffen worden. Dabei kamen drei Zivilisten ums Leben. Die Hamas feuerte nach eigenen Angaben mehr als 400 Raketen und Granaten Richtung Israel ab. Israel seinerseits griff am zweiten Tag der Gefechte mehr als 200 Ziele in Gaza an. Dabei wurden 13 Menschen getötet. Begonnen hatte die israelische Offensive gestern mit der gezielten Tötung des Hamas-Militärchefs Ahmad al-Jabari in seinem Auto. Die israelische Armee veröffentlichte heute ein Video von der Aktion. Keine Regierung würde tolerieren, dass fast ein Fünftel der Bevölkerung unter ständigen Raketenbeschuss leben muss und Israel wird das auch nicht tolerieren. Getroffen wurde heute neben Kiryat Malachi auch die Stadt Rishon Lizion. Bedroht von den Raketen sind alle israelischen Städte in einem Radius von 75 Kilometern, also auch Tel Aviv. Auch dort waren heute mehrere Explosionen zu hören. Für mehr als eine Million Menschen findet das Leben überwiegend in Bunkern statt, auch für diese 68 Frühgeborenen in einem Krankenhaus in Beersheba. Dieses zwei Tage alte Frühchen hat noch nicht einmal einen Namen. In Windeseile wurde hier im Bunker medizinische Notversorgung für die Säuglinge hergestellt. Allen 68 geht es gesundheitlich gut, aber psychisch geht es den Eltern schlecht. Neben der Sorge um die Gesundheit ihrer Kinder kommt jetzt einfach noch die Sorge um ihre Sicherheit dazu. Israel ist entschlossen, dieser Bedrohung ein schnelles Ende zu setzen. Den ganzen Tag wurden Panzer an die Grenze des Gazastreifens verlegt, Reservisten wurden einberufen, Hinweise für eine bevorstehende Bodenoffensive. Zuletzt waren israelische Soldaten vor vier Jahren in den Gazastreifen eingerückt. Ja, und wir schalten zu unserer Israel-Korrespondentin Rachel Blufarb nach Jerusalem, die inzwischen zurück ist aus dem Süden des Landes. Rachel, palästinensische Raketen auf israelische Großstädte wie Tel Aviv. Weiß man denn schon mehr über Opfer oder Schäden? Ja, niemand wurde von den Raketen getroffen. Es gab auch keine Sachschäden. Das liegt daran, da die Raketen im offenen Meer gelandet sind. Und doch hat das in Tel Aviv riesengroße Panik ausgelöst, weil es das erste Mal seit 20 Jahren ist, dass es überhaupt in Tel Aviv einen Luftalarm gegeben hat, geschweige denn, dass da Raketen eingeschlagen sind. Tel Aviv gilt als sicherste Metropole Israels und das ist jetzt hier ein bisschen angekratzt. Die Raketen hat die Hamas übrigens aus dem Iran bekommen. Die reichen bis zu 75 Kilometer weit. Das ist ein eine ganz neue Bedrohung für Israel. Rachel Blufa, vielen Dank nach Jerusalem. Zwischen Israelis und Palästinensern im Gazastreifen sind die schwersten Kämpfe seit Jahren ausgebrochen. Nach der gezielten Tötung des Hamas-Militärchefs durch Israel befürchten nun viele einen neuen Krieg im Nahen Osten. Militante Palästinenser feuerten aus dem Gazastreifen hunderte Raketen auf israelisches Gebiet ab. In Kiryat Malachi wurden drei Menschen getötet. In Tel Aviv wurde am Abend erstmals seit dem Golfkrieg 1991 Luftalarm ausgelöst. Bei israelischen Angriffen auf Ziele im Gazastreifen kamen heute mindestens 15 Menschen ums Leben. Sie fordern Vergeltung und tragen ihren ermordeten Militärchef zu Grabe. Gaza heute Morgen, die Beerdigung von Ahmed Jabari. Für Israel ein Terrorist, für die Hamas ein Held. Jabari, Chef der gefürchteten kasam brigaden war mitverantwortlich für den Raketenbeschuss auf Israel. Auch heute beschießt die Hamas Israel im Dauerfeuer. Und israelische Flugzeuge und Kriegsschiffe greifen weiter Raketenstellungen der Hamas an. Bilder von diesen Angriffen gibt die israelische Armee frei. Vor allem die palästinensische Zivilbevölkerung leidet unter dem Beschuss. Zerstörung, wohin man schaut. 
Verletzte werden in Krankenhäuser gebracht. Die Hamas hat ihre Stellungen oft in Wohngebiete verlegt. Die Führung der Islamisten aber hat sich in Sicherheit gebracht, gibt Statements aus dem Untergrund ab. Die Hamas und auch die kasam brigaden werden weiter unser Volk verteidigen und beschützen. Im Westjordanland gibt es heute Proteste gegen die israelischen Angriffe. Eigentlich unterstützt man hier die Hamas nicht. Doch jetzt bricht sogar Palästinenser Präsident Abbas eine Europareise ab. Höchste Alarmstufe heute auch im Süden Israels. Die Straßen in der Grenzstadt Ashkelon sind verwaist, die Schulen geschlossen. Bewohner trauen sich nicht auf die Straße. Denn am Morgen haben Raketen Kiryat Malachi getroffen. Drei junge Israelis werden getötet, mehrere schwer verletzt. Israels Premier zeigt sich am Abend besorgt, beschuldigt die Hamas, einen Krieg gegen Israel und die eigene Bevölkerung zu führen. Israel wird alles nur Erdenkliche unternehmen, um seine Bürger zu beschützen. Die israelische Armee schließt eine Bodenoffensive in den nächsten Tagen nicht aus und verlegt weitere Truppen in den Süden. Zum Luftalarm in Tel Aviv jetzt live mein Kollege Richard Schneider. Vor etwa einer Stunde gab es hier in Tel Aviv, im ganzen Raum Tel Aviv, zum ersten Mal seit dem Golfkrieg 1991 wieder Raketenalarm. Und es sind tatsächlich einige Raketen hier in der größeren Region von Tel Aviv niedergegangen. Es ist nichts geschehen, aber es ist psychologisch natürlich schon eine Grenze überschritten worden. Die Israelis haben immer gesagt, sollte Tel Aviv angegriffen werden, dann ist für uns endgültig eine rote Linie überschritten. Verteidigungsminister Barak hat heute prinzipiell zugestimmt, etwa 30.000 Reservisten einzuberufen. Ob sie alle einberufen werden und wann, ist noch nicht genau klar. Aber es scheint, dass nach dem heutigen Abend eine Bodenoffensive, ein Einmarsch nach Gaza näher gekommen ist. Und damit gebe ich zurück nach Hamburg zu Thorsten Schröder. International verursachte die Eskalation in Nahost große Besorgnis. UN-Generalsekretär Ban Ki-moon rief beide Seiten zu Zurückhaltung auf. US-Präsident Obama bekräftigte Israels Recht auf Selbstverteidigung. Er sicherte Regierungschef Netanyahu Unterstützung zu, forderte aber zugleich, Todesopfer in der palästinensischen Zivilbevölkerung zu vermeiden. Die Organisation für islamische Zusammenarbeit verurteilte das israelische Vorgehen als Angriff auf die islamische Gemeinschaft insgesamt und rief den UN-Sicherheitsrat an. Wie die ägyptische Regierung auf die Eskalation im Nahen Osten reagiert, dazu jetzt live aus Kairo, mein Kollege Jörg Armbruster. Ägyptens Präsident Morsi versteht Ägypten als so etwas wie eine Schutzmacht der Hamas und des Gazastreifens. Für morgen hat er seinen Ministerpräsidenten Kandil in den Gazastreifen abgeordnet. Er soll dort der Hamas die Solidarität Ägyptens versichern. Ob er darüber hinaus noch weitere Aufträge hat, wissen wir nicht. Eine israelische Bodenoffensive werde, so fürchtet Mursi, die gesamte Region destabilisieren. Gleichzeitig hat er die USA aufgefordert, eine israelische Aggression zu verhindern. Von einer Hamas-Aggression spricht er nicht. Die Grenze zwischen Ägypten und dem Gazastreifen hat er für Notfälle geöffnet. Hier in Ägypten werden die Stimmen immer lauter die fordern, den Friedensvertrag mit Israel zu hinterfragen. Und damit zurück nach Hamburg. Weitere Hintergrundinformationen und einen Kommentar zur Entwicklung im Nahen Osten finden Sie auf tagesschau.de. Xi Jinping ist der neue starke Mann in China. Auf einer Sitzung des Zentralkomitees wurde er zum Generalsekretär der Kommunistischen Partei ernannt, als Nachfolger von Staatspräsident Hu Jintao. Zugleich übernimmt Xi den Oberbefehl über das Militär. Im Frühjahr kommenden Jahres soll er auch an die Staatsspitze rücken. Nach monatelangem Machtkampf hinter den Kulissen stellte Xi heute seine neue Führungsmannschaft vor, den ständigen Ausschuss des Politbüros. Der Platz des himmlischen Friedens leergefegt, das Volk wieder weiträumig ausgesperrt, denn in der großen Halle tritt die neue Machtelite auf. Allen voran Xi Jinping, sieben statt bislang neun Mitglieder im mächtigen Ausschuss, das macht es leichter für ihn zu regieren. Die einen wollen die Wirtschaft reformieren, die anderen dabei auch die starke Stellung des Staates bewahren. Xi betont den Reformbedarf in den eigenen Reihen. Wir haben vor allem ein Problem mit Korruption. Parteimitglieder und Kader lassen sich bestechen und haben den Kontakt zu der Bevölkerung verloren. Xi ist Abkomme einer einflussreichen Familie mit langer Parteitradition, ein sogenannter Prinzling. 
Sein Vater war ein mächtiger Kader schon unter Mao. Als er in Ungnade fällt, wird sein Sohn Xi aufs Land verbannt und lebt in diesen Höhlen. Trotz des Mao-Terrors gegen seine Familie will Xi unbedingt Parteimitglied werden und dient sich bis ganz nach oben. Seine Frau ist eine populäre Sängerin im Rang einer Generalmajorin, Angehörige der Volksbefreiungsarmee. Xi gilt als weltoffen, kann aber auch den Hardliner geben. Manche Leute aus dem Westen mit vollen Bäuchen haben nichts Besseres zu tun, als uns zu kritisieren, kanzelt er schon mal Kritik an China ab. Und Xi kann dogmatisch sein. Auch vom Sozialismus mit chinesischen Charakteristiken war heute die Rede. So soll das China der Zukunft sein. Wirtschaftliche Reformen darf man von den neuen Machthabern erwarten. Ausgewiesene Marktliberale wurden in den ständigen Ausschuss berufen. Umwälzende politische Reformen sollte man nicht erwarten. Die Führungselite hat unmissverständlich klargemacht, China soll ein autoritärer Einparteienstaat bleiben. Der britische Ölmulti BP hat die Schuld für die Ölkatastrophe auf der Deepwater Horizon im Jahr 2010 übernommen und wird 4,5 Milliarden Dollar Strafe zahlen. Darauf einigte sich der Konzern außergerichtlich mit den US-Behörden. Es ist die höchste Geldstrafe, die je ein Konzern in den USA zahlen musste. Die Ölplattform war im April 2010 explodiert. Elf Arbeiter kamen ums Leben. Fast 90 Tage lang flossen Millionen Liter Öl unkontrolliert in den Golf von Mexiko. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jack Daly, director of the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here to our flagship building on the Mall. It's a, the program this morning is a downlink with astronauts on the International Space Station in recognition of International Education Week. Today's event is a collaborative effort among the Smithsonian Institution, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, the U.S. Department of Education, and the Student Spaceflight Experiments Program of the National Center for Earth and Space Science Education. In addition to the eager group of students we have here in the museum, more than 9,557 students will participate by live webcast being made possible by NASA television. We hope this memorable educational experience will inspire all of you to learn more about the space program and develop a lifelong interest in its future. Our Earth-based location for today's program, the Moving Beyond Earth Gallery, is a perfect setting because it explores the history of human spaceflight with a special attention to the shuttle era. This is one of the most dynamic galleries in our museum, and along with the artifacts and interactive displays, it serves as a location for live performances as well as te television broadcasts and webcasts such as we're doing today. The sponsor of the Moving Beyond Earth exhibition is the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. The Smithsonian Institution and NASA have been working together for decades. In 1966, the Space Act Agreement established the Smithsonian as the official repository of the nation's space artifacts. In April, NASA delivered the space shuttle discovery to our museum site out at Dulles Airport, the Stephen F. Udvarhazy Center. The Smithsonian Institution has embarked on an ambitious plan that puts its original mandate, the increase in diffusion of knowledge, in a new light emphasizing education. Our plan also promotes the benefits of collaboration, and today's event is an excellent example of both collabor collaboration and education, and it's our honor to work with the Department of Education. It's now my pleasure to introduce the Deputy Secretary of the U.S. Department of Education, Mr. Tony Miller. Thank you very much. Uh, really is my pleasure to be, to be with you all this morning. Uh, my name is Tony Miller, and I am the Deputy Secretary at the Department of Education. Um, and I hope you are as excited as I am to be here. Uh, I want to thank, thank in particular the Johnson Space Center, Teaching from Space Office, who we've partnered with over the last 10 years, and who's responsible today for bringing us the downlink and allowing us to participate. I also want to thank the Air and Space Museum. Um, I can't think of a more fitting place 
than to be here for today's event. Now, in just a few minutes, we'll be talking with the space station commander, Sunita Williams. Now, she holds the world record for the woman who has spent the most time in space. And we'll also be talking with NASA astronaut Kevin Ford. So I hope you have your questions ready. Now, we're, while we're still waiting for the space station to begin, to, they need to get in range so that we can communicate. For those of you who understand and the, the space communication, as we'll learn about today, I want to use the next few moments to talk to the students in the room and almost the 10,000 students and in their communities in the United States and Canada who are joining us online. Now, when I was your age, which was clearly a, a little while ago, um, I remember watching Star Trek and seeing the latest James Bond movie, and I would see all these amazing gadgets, and I'd wonder, wow, will those things ever be real? Will I be able to kind of do the kinds of things that I'm seeing in the movies and on TV? And now it's remarkable that I take for granted some of those very things that seems to be so way out there and futuristic when I was your age. Things like personal computers, personal entertainment devices. So think about it and ask yourself, what are the things today that you think about seem way futuristic, almost hard to imagine? Think about those things. Which ones of those do you think will be a regular part of your life when you're an adult? I bring this up because it's very likely that some of you, some of you right here in this room, will be the ones to create the equivalent of the next cell phone, to create the internet, to create the next tablet, and to bring about scientific advances that will help us solve global problems for people all over the world. You're growing up in an exciting time, but also a time when we're facing some big challenges that are going to require the best thinking intellectually, the best thinking creatively, and frankly, a real sense of humanity. And I want to stress to you then the importance of your education and the need to be physically fit because being a healthy citizen is the combination of a healthy body and a strong mind. So since taking my current role here, I help to lead the improvement, where I, where I, what I do now is I help to lead the improvement of the US education system. Now in that role, I've had the pleasure of meetings with my colleagues from countries from all around the world. And the conversations we have have shown me that the challenges that we face, they're the same in the US in China, in Brazil, and Russia. We all agree that it's education that will lead kids out of poverty and that will give you a chance. We recognize that whether you want to be an astronaut or a doctor or a teacher or a technician, if whatever inspires you, that you must value your education and your health and the role that both will play in opening up opportunities for you to follow your passions. And as the Deputy Secretary of Education, but frankly, as a father, I have the same hope for you that I have for my own son. And that's both you and he can grow into the global citizens who are able to pursue their dreams at home and abroad, or frankly, even in outer space. I hope you'll take some time to thank your teachers. I'm sure both of these astronauts will tell you that, you, that they had some pretty engaging math and science teachers who inspired them to pursue careers in science, technology, engineering, and math, what we call STEM. And so it's important that the role that teachers and your parents have been playing. They play a very important role, and, uh, and I hope that, that you will be encouraged as you pursue your careers in STEM and think about becoming the next set of teachers to inspire future generations of innovators and dreamers. Now, speaking of innovators, an exciting part of today's event is that this year we're working with the National Center for Earth and Space Science Education to see students work actually in action. This unique student spaceflight experimental program gives students around the globe the chance to bring their science experience on microgravity to outer space. So I want to thank you today for allowing me to share this moment with you. Now let me hear who's ready to talk with the space station. You ready?
Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Uh, yes, we are ready. Houston, this is Station. We are ready for the event. They said do flips. Great. National Air and Space Museum, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. Yep. Okay. Station, this is Deputy Secretary Tony Miller, along with students, scientists participating in the Student Space Flight Experiments Program. How do you hear me? We hear you loud and clear aboard the International Space Station. Welcome aboard. All right. <laughs> I would tell you my commander's upside down, but perhaps it's the camera that was upside down, and me. <laughs> uh, uh, well, it's, it's, it's very exciting to be here, and we're really looking forward to, to having our students talk with you and learn about what it's like to be in space, and they could ask you some of your questions. Okay, turn up your mic. Okay. Well, it's okay. an honor to be here at Smithsonian with you, and... Uh, yeah, when you're upside down or upside right, your hair still stands on end. <laughs> hey, Sonny, this is Leland. You at least have some hair. <laughs> hey, Kevin. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, I know you weren't talking about me, Leland. I think you were talking about yourself, right? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, Kevin. Is there a time limit that you're allowed to stay in space? That's a very interesting question. You know, usually we're up here about six months because that's the lifetime, approximate lifetime of the Soyuz spacecraft, which is the way we got up here and also our rescue boat and the way we're getting home. But we're thinking about now in the near future having people stay up for longer, possibly a year, and then we could do all sorts of long-term science experiments on them and have them be very experienced while they're up here, sort of leading down the path on our next steps, uh, going on further space travel, leaving low Earth orbit. So yes and no, I think, is the answer to your question. Thank you, ISS. Our next question comes from Callaway and Pleasanton, Nebraska. Nebraska, go ahead with your question. We read that being in space causes fluid to swell in your brain and increases pressure on your eyes. Could you describe this feeling for us? Uh, absolutely, it's, it's true because uh, you're so used to being in the one gravity environment that you're on on Earth and your muscles and your vascular system compensates for that and keeps the blood pressure usually high in your head. So when you lose the gravity and when you come to space, the blood pressure just naturally increases in your head because it doesn't have to pump against gravity anymore. And so for the first couple of weeks, I've been here about, uh, oh, maybe three and a half weeks now, something like that, and uh, in space that is. And uh, so uh, when I first got here, I really felt the swelling in my head, and I feel a little bit of congestion. It goes away with a few weeks' time, though, and uh, your body adapts to it very well. So it's just one of those things that's initially with you during your space flight, and then uh, the body compensates. Okay, thank you, ISS. Our next question comes from uh, Presidio, Texas. Presidio, go ahead with your question. Young kids like me about pursuing our dreams. ISS, did you copy? Question was uh, what what to tell um, kids like you who want to live and uh, fulfill your dreams. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, well, um, let me just tell you a quick little story about myself. I sort of felt that I was a little bit in second place my whole life. 
you know, swimming. I didn't get into a uh, college that I wanted to, my first choice. I didn't get to fly jets. I flew helicopters. And so, you know, I didn't always get to do exactly what I wanted. But you know what? Um, it, the path that I ended up taking got me really interested in learning about how helicopters work, which sent me to test pilot school, which got me interested in being an astronaut. So the point of my story is here and what to tell kids about living their dreams is, you know, you're going to be disappointed along the way, but that's okay because it's going to open new doors and new things for you to think about and learn about and uh, just have your eyes wide open and get ready for all those challenges because they'll be out there, but they'll be fun. And uh, the rewards are great if you try hard, work hard, and do your best. Thank you, ISS. Okay, up next, our uh, question comes from Valley Center, Kansas. Valley Center, go ahead with your question. Thank you. My question is, was there anything you were not prepared for when you first went into space? Well, the first time I came into space, uh, well, the one thing I, I really wasn't prepared for, and I'm not sure anybody can be totally prepared for it, is that you are in a place now where there is no up and down. Your entire life, uh, even when you wake up in the morning before you open your eyes, you know which way is up and which way is down, and everything in your house is built for up and down, the walls, the way your faucets work, uh, everything is, uh, is based around gravity. And up here, you can be in any orientation, you can get really used to flying through a module uh, using the ceiling as a floor or the wall as a floor if you'd like to, to get your orientations. And um, many times you'll, you'll find yourself lost. And if you drop something, it can go, instead of one direction to the floor, it can go really in six different directions. And it's really hard to find and keep track of things. So I say that is the one most confusing thing that I wasn't prepared for when I came to space the first time. Thank you, ISS. OK, up next is Hilo, Hawaii. Hilo, go ahead with your question, please. What are some of the advancements made in engineering and science due to research conducted aboard the International Space Station and who profit from these? That's a great question, and I'll give you two examples. You know, we have a uh, water processing system here, which uh, in, you know, short terms uh, essentially turns pee back into drinking water. And so, you know, it's really putting it through the the paces to try to make not so nice water turned into clean drinking water and some of that technology has been used all over the world particularly in places where we had natural disasters a smaller version to uh, clean the water so people could have really nice good clean drinking water and helping them out in a more portable uh, way to be able to do that other things that we're doing up here that are going to help us in the science and space field of course are things like capillary flow which are going to help us make better um, engines, maybe the engines that don't need pumps that can last a little bit longer time, take advantage of the capillary flow in microgravity. So that's just a couple examples of things that we're doing on board the space station that benefit folks back on the ground as well as advancements in technology and science in space. Thank you, ISS. Up next is Portland, Oregon. Portland, please go ahead with your question. Our question is for Sunny. How much control do you have over the space station? For example, do you use rockets to move the station to protect you from space debris? You know, that's a great question. In general, we don't really have to do much at all. The space station sort of takes care of itself as well as the ground controllers who are always watching the space station telemetry and making sure we're all okay up here. Uh, what they do also on the ground is track big space debris or space debris that's about a softball size. And we, of course, don't want to get hit by that. And so we can actually change the attitude of the space station to avoid that. And we also can do a reboost, which will bring us to a higher altitude so we can avoid that debris as well. 
well. Here on the space station ourselves, you know, if we had to, if we needed to, we are trained on the guidance, navigation, and control systems which monitor and can do some of those things. But in general, we have enough time. We can predict where these things are happening, and the folks on the ground um, put the algorithms together and they uh, start those maneuvers. So in general, we don't do too much maneuvering up here, but if we had to, we can. Thank you, ISS. Up next is Cicero, Illinois. Cicero, go ahead with your question. Cicero, do you copy? Okay, we're going to move on to Willis, Texas. Willis, Texas, go ahead with your question. What would you do if an astronaut had a serious medical emergency while on the International Space Station? Well, uh, it's a possibility, of course, uh, just like it is on Earth, that anything could happen at any time. So we have a medical training staff in Houston that teaches us all about all the medical, um, the most likely medical events that could happen. And um, they give us, uh, and we're not all doctors. We do have some doctors who are astronauts, so you might want to go down that track someday if you'd like to be a doctor and then an astronaut. Uh, have one joining me soon in December. But uh, none of us on board right now are doctors, but we get some training. And uh, one of the things, for example, they teach us is CPR, something really everybody should learn uh, as early as they can. Um, up here, if we were to do CPR, we have our board right behind us. Sonny was just uh, looking at it. We have a board back here that's ready for an emergency at any time. We could strap a person down if they were having some kind of convulsions or something like that. Maybe if they got um, maybe they got some gas or some kind of poison or something from an event and you could strap them down and Sonny is showing how you would do the CPR on somebody because if you were to push on somebody on the board when you push down on them you would just fly across the module so Sonny is showing how she would put her feet on the ceiling and actually do her CPR against the patient on that board but we also get trained in how to give stitches how to do some uh, just some basic dental work uh, and just take care of each other, medications. We do a lot of diagnostics, eye exams, ear exams, and those kinds of things, and we report to the doctors. And then ultimately on the ground, we have doctors who are always on call for us. They can be ready to talk to us uh, in an instant at any time and help us with any crew member who has any kind of a medical emergency. That, that's a really great question. Thank you, ISS. Up next is Russell County, Virginia. Russell County, go ahead with your question. Thank you. While in space, how do you communicate with your families? That's another great question because it's really important to stay in touch with folks back on the ground. I think for both us up here and also our friends and family on the ground who are, of course, worrying and thinking about us. So, you know, we have an IP phone, internet protocol phone, when the satellite is lined up with a, you know, a satellite out in, when our antennas are lined up with a satellite out in space, uh, we have the ability to make a phone call. It happens to be like the same communication why we have video right now. Um, other things we have, of course, are email. We don't have instant messaging, un unfortunately. We have synced email, so every couple hours our email gets synchronized with the ground and then we get email back and forth. Um, we also have video conferences. Once, uh, once a week on the weekend, um, I get to see my dog because I can't talk to him on the phone, so he's actually with my parents and I get to see him on the video conference. Thank you, ISS. Up next, San Marino, California. San Marino, please go ahead with your question. Are there any developments involving space exploration that can contribute to combating some of the problems on Earth today, such as renewable energy sources or global warming? Well, uh, the energy we use here that lights, the, lights up inside the laboratory and powers this microphone and camera you're looking at is all coming from the sun. So uh, these solar power uh, cells that we have out here are part of 
really kind of the development, engineering development of future space vehicles, and of course these things can all be uh, applied to Earth, Earth-based as well. Also, um, we do, you know, crew Earth observations. Uh, when you talk about um, the climate and that sort of thing, we can help with uh, photos and observations from space, not only from a space station, but other from space vehicles as well, to try to track what's going on, make analyses so that we can um, hopefully find out uh, exactly what kind of impacts perhaps we're having and, and make advancements there and just, uh, just study the problem. Thank you, ISS. Up next is Traverse City, Michigan. Traverse City, go ahead with your question. What's your favorite part about being a part of the SSEP? The last part of the question, what's a favorite part about being part of, can you repeat the last part of the question? Yes, that was, what is your favorite part about being involved in the Student Space Flight Experiments Program? Yeah, well, you know, I think that's a, part of, a big part of the whole reason why we're up here in the first place. You know, we're on the International Space Station. It's orbiting the planet. Um, but the next generation of explorers is out there. It's you guys. And uh, we're up here hopefully being part of this program to inspire you, to, for you to see how much fun it is, how cool it is to actually be an astronaut and be involved in, the, in developing the next generation of spacecraft and the things that that will, spacecraft will do, which is probably going to be going beyond low Earth orbit. So uh, I feel pretty honored to be part of it. I hope we're getting you guys psyched up because your future is huge. I'm a little bit envious. I wish I was about 20 years younger so I could be in your shoes um, going to be doing the things that you're going to be doing with, in regards to space and space travel. So um, very honored and uh, psyched to be part of this program. So thank you for inviting us. Thank you, ISS. Up next is Lake County, Indiana. Lake County, go ahead with your question. Thank you. Is there any downtime on the space station and what do you do with that time? Well, uh, greetings. Uh, you're, you're in my home state there. I grew up in Indiana, so it's great to hear from you up in Lake County. Um, in our spare time, we uh, catch up on our communications with friends and family at home uh, first so that we can keep the, that, those relationships going, of course. And then uh, we uh, go to the window as often as we can. Uh, occasionally, I'll go to the window really early morning or even middle of the night, and I'll find another astronaut all, already there <laughs> looking out because it's a great way to spend your time getting really familiar with our, uh, our beautiful planet. Um, and, of course, uh, some of us have little, little things we like to do in the zero gravity because uh, we know we won't be here long. It's a little bit like a dream being here. So there's, some, uh, there's things to play with and spin around. I have a little Soyuz in my pocket. And uh, it's fun to get those out. We, this is the model of the little spacecraft we flew up in. And we spin as we come in here. So I can make this spin just like my own little spacecraft did on the way. And uh, <laughs> it's just kind of fun um, to see how things react and the dynamics. There's some kind of unexpected things up here. So we, we play around in the zero gravity. And we look at our uh, Mother Earth most of the time. Thank you, ISS. Up next, Inwood, New York. Inwood, go ahead with your question, please. Okay, the question from Inwood, New York, ISS is, what was your first aha moment in space? I think on, uh, my first aha moment, of course, is when you get to space. You know, it only takes about eight and a half minutes or so to take the rocket ride up into space. And then, you know, the engines on the vehicle shut off. I was on a shuttle for my first flight. And then you're 
ready to take your helmet off and your gloves off. And when you do, it doesn't weigh anything and it starts to float away and your gloves start to float away and literally your arms start to float. You know, on Earth, we don't realize it, but gravity is holding your arms down. Just like when you sleep in space, you, if you don't think about it, your arms will start to float back up again. So I think, of course, that had to be the biggest aha moment. It was just incredible. And it just makes you laugh because it's like, this is just really cool. So, um, of course, that's number one. I think number two, I have to add number two, on a spacewalk, up on top of the space station, on a solar array, watching the aurora uh, hit the Earth. And when you see this green energy, hitting the planet, uh, you sort of realize that, uh, you know, there's a whole lot of energy in the universe that's pretty much untapped, and we, we have a lot more to discover and learn about. So that really hit home. It was a huge aha moment. Thank you, ISS. We have time for one more quick question from El Paso, Texas. El Paso, please go ahead with your question. Thank you. Have you ever seen anything in space that surprised or scared you? Well, I'll take it uh, just shortly and then uh, I'll pass it off to Sunny. Uh, everything surprises you in space. Uh, from the time you get up, uh, cruising through a lab at nighttime with everybody sleeping and floating down a dark aisle to uh, just when you uh, lose control maybe of your drink or your water bag and the water particles just go every direction instead of falling on your floor. So surprising. I haven't fortunately really been scared yet. Uh, there are some times when things really get your attention. Uh, I remember coming up uh, in this last flight on the rendezvous day uh, our Soyuz rendezvous was really aggressive and we got uh, came out the station really fast so there's a lot of things that make your heart beat quickly sometimes but nothing uh, that was really really scary for me and I'll hand it since that was the last question I'll hand it back over to the commander of expedition 33 for final words So we wanted to just say thank you, if that was the last question, for letting us participate in, uh, in this event with you. It's been great. The Smithsonian's a, a wonderful place, just amazing to be part of it. Uh, the ISS is just a wonderful place, again, amazing to be an honor to be part of it. And um, we're, we're hoping, again, that we uh, are inspiring the next generations of explorers because this is just a stepping stone. ISS is great, but it's just a stepping stone. You guys, you guys are the next ones who are going to take the next big steps. So uh, get psyched out there, and uh, we're looking forward to watching you guys in the future. Thank you, ISS. Let's hear it for Commander Williams and Colonel Ford. Okay, we are going to continue uh, the questioning. Our next speaker is the Associate Administrator for Education at NASA, Leland Melvin. Leland is responsible for the development and implementation of the agency's education programs. Leland is also a veteran of two space shuttle missions to the International Space Station, serving as mission specialist on STS-122 in 2008 and STS-129 in 2009. Ladies and gentlemen, Associate Administrator and Astronaut Leland Melvin. Okay, how's everyone doing? Did you guys have a good time? Well, it's just starting, okay? So we have a few more questions out there. I think we have Lincolnwood, Illinois. You want to ask, answer your question? Ask your question? missions and travels, does NASA work well and cooperate with the other agencies aboard the International Space Station, such as the European Space Agency, Russia, Canada, and Japan? That's a very good question. We work with all of those agencies, and when I think about the students in here and the students out there in the, in the, uh, in the internet land, you know, we have to work together as one big team, because if we're going to go to Mars one day as a civilization, it takes all of us to work together, so we work with all of these countries. We want to work with even more countries in the future. So, very good question. Next question is from New, uh, Penasaukin, New Jersey. How long are you? Oh, okay. How long 
are you a microgravity before you start to notice changes in your body or health, or and what are those changes? That's a very good question. Um, I was only in space for about 14 days maximum. And once you get there, your body does start to feel the effects of microgravity and some changes. But for the long duration space flight members, you know, they're there for six months at a time. And so if they don't work out and do resistive exercise, you know, push-ups and, and resistive, resistive things, that their muscles will atrophy and their bones will actually leach out the calcium. So they'll have, their bones will get weaker. So it's very important for long duration space flight that you do cardiovascular workouts as well as the uh, resistive exercise. Very good question. Thank you. Next we have Galva Holston, Iowa. What's your question? Ready? What do you think of the Student Space Flight Experiments Program? And what it does for students? Well, for the uh, space flight program for students, I think it's an opportunity to think about themselves as being researchers and scientists. You know, when I was a little boy, I mixed chemicals together and created an explosion in my mom's living room. And I don't want you guys to do that. But I think about you being little principal investigators that will send your experiments to the space station. Sonny's bringing back 23 experiments when she comes back home on Sunday and we'll see the results of those experiments. But this sets the tone to get you guys ready to be the next inventors, explorers, and scientists. It's a great opportunity for you to do that in that program. Good question. Next we have Guilford County, North Carolina. What are the challenges and advantages of working with astronauts from other countries? I think, uh, kind of like what I mentioned earlier, the, 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 biggest, the biggest, I think, challenge that we have is sometimes the language barrier. In, you know, when we're in Russia, when we're in Russia, we learn Russian. Uh, when we're in the other countries, we try to learn some of those languages. But I think everyone comes together as a team because we have this this outpost up 240 miles up, traveling at 17,500 miles per hour, and we're working together as one civilization to advance ourselves for peaceful purposes. So the challenges are usually language but the, it, the, the benefits are helping everyone on the planet advance as one civilization. Good question. Next we have Odebol in Ida Grove, Iowa. What's your question? Yeah, how does it feel to be weightless and what was something that you like to do in microgravity that was not as easily done on Earth? Interesting question. Weightlessness was awesome. You could actually ball yourself up in a ball and be bowled down and knock over other astronauts. So that's something you can't do on the ground. Um, playing with your food in space is pretty cool. I'll show a video about that a little bit later. But it's working together in this environment to see the advances for the future, for helping people here on the planet. And I think that's the biggest part of microgravity that's the beneficial piece of the experiments, the working together, the thinking about the future of exploration. Good question. Next we have Santa Monica, California. What's your question? What is, the, what is the most difficult thing to adapt to when you get to the ISS? And when you return to the ISS, when you return to Earth from the ISS? Good question. The most difficult thing to adapt to? Hmm. I would say that's going to the bathroom. Because in space, everything floats. Number one's not so bad, but number two, that's the problem. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> we'll talk about that more later. <laughs> All right, next we have Chicago, Illinois. What's your question? Can you see hur hurricanes and other weather activity from space? And if so, what do they look like? Okay, I wasn't up there, but I'm sure that both, um, both Sonny and Kevin saw uh, the Hurricane Sandy from space, and it looks, you know, it's like the weather satellites that show you the pictures on the Weather Channel. It looks very similar to that, but we can track it for much longer times. We have our video cameras, we have our, you know, wide-angle lenses and, and, and long uh, zoom lenses, so you can see pretty much everything from that vantage point with different lenses. Very good question. Okay, next we're going to have 
Stonewall, Manitoba, Canada. What's your question? Thank you. Hello. My question is, is the Canadian arm helpful, useful in space? Okay, is the Canadian arm helpful? Well, when I went to space, I was the robotic arm operator, and I used Canada Arm 1 and Canada Arm 2 to install the European Space Agency's laboratory. So it was extremely helpful, and it was the only way that we could actually install these modules onto the space station. So yes, our Canadian friends came through with a great device. Good question. Next question is from New York City. What's your question from New York? I would think that perfumes aren't allowed because the alcohol can kind of outgas and maybe get on different equipment. You, don't, you want to make sure that the things that you take up don't come out of their solution and get deposited on the, on the equipment on the space station. So that's, that's what I think. But that's a very good question. And our last question is from East Lyme, Connecticut. What's your question? Is East Lyme out there? Okay. Okay. We're going to go back to Cicero. Does Cicero have another question? There we go. How is life in space different from life on Earth? How is life different on space than life on Earth? Well, when Sunny comes back on Sunday, she's going to probably have this moment where she grabs her plate and she puts food on her plate, and then she probably turns and thinks that the plate's going to keep floating. <laughs> and it doesn't. It hits the ground. So thinking about how you do things in a 1G environment on the planet, in gravity, this gravitational pull, and how you can do things differently in space, a lot of that has to do with the physiological things that happen, well, you know, when you're eating, using the bathroom, as I mentioned, flying and floating around, but also with experiments. Like if you're doing an experiment on crystal growth, you can grow single crystals at a much larger, larger size than you can on the one gravitational pull on the, on the planet. So doing experiments and things like that can utilize the benefits of microgravity. Very good question. All right. Okay, is East Lime on the line? East Lime, are you there? Going once. Okay, all right. Well, thank you for all those fantastic questions. Sonny's bringing back. Thank you. Sonny's bringing back the experiments um, on Sunday, as I mentioned, and you'll get to see the results of that work that's been done. I'm going to turn on my wireless mic real quick. I'm turning on the wireless mic because I'm going to roam around. Okay. You guys like that? Oh, come on. I can do better than that. Did you like that? Are you guys awake? All right. Well, how many of you dream? Any dreamers in here? What do, you, what do you dream about? You dream? Come and stand up. You don't want to stand up? Okay. What did you dream? I dream about my future. She dreams about, what's your name? Kayla. Kayla. She dreams about her future. Is your future bright? It's very bright. How many of you dream about your future and what you're going to do? Be a scientist, an engineer, a ball player, whatever you want to be. But it starts with you living your dreams right now. What does that mean to you, living your dreams? Anyone want to help me? Yes. Exactly. He said, work hard now so your dreams can come true. Well, when I was a little boy, I didn't know what I wanted to do. When I was in middle school, I had no clue. Next slide, what I wanted to do. 
And if you look at the slides, if they're turning or... You want to help me here? Virtual click? You can go to the next slide. I had no clue. I love sports and I love science. Okay? And as I mentioned earlier, I had a chance to make this most incredible, I'm telling you, incredible explosion. But first, I made a skateboard. How many of you are skateboarders in here? Any skateboarders? Any football players? Basketball players? Tennis? Hockey? Ice skating? Soccer? Volleyball? What, what else? OK. All right, so I love sports as a kid. But my dad, I asked my dad for a skateboard when I was a little boy. He said, we don't have the money to buy you one. So what did I do? I didn't give up. I used my brain. At Dunbar Middle School, I went to the wood shop, and I got a piece of wood, and I made the board in the shop. So I had half of the solution was my board. The next piece was the trucks and the wheels. So I got a job delivering papers, doing odd things, made the money, and I've created my own skateboard. So using your brain, using your hands, using your innovation and curiosity is very important to getting the things that you want. So started that with skateboarding. Then my mom gave me this chemistry set. I made this huge explosion in the living room, which fueled my curiosity. I became a chemistry major from that. And then also sports was very important. Next slide. So where did that lead me? That led me to being a snowboarder, OK? Led me to being a chemist, which you see here is a mad scientist in the chemistry lab. And it also led me to the NFL. Yes. How many of you want to play in the NFL? OK. All right, you can do that. But the key is, if that doesn't work out, you've got to have your education, right? I went to training camp. I was drafted in the 11th round to the Detroit Lions. I pulled a hamstring the second week in training camp. That was the end of my football career. But I had my education to fall back on, which allowed me to then become an astronaut. So again, you can do whatever you want to if you put your mind to it, but you gotta have your education. Our deputy secretary over here believes in that. You gotta have your education. We work together as a team with the Smithsonian, with General Daly, with Tony Miller in education to ensure you have all the tools you need to do anything you want to do, anything you believe in, anything you put your mind to. Next slide. Wait a minute. Somebody snuck this picture in here. These are my two dogs that I tried to get to space, but they wouldn't take them. Any, any, any dog owners in here? A few dog owners? OK. So that's Jake and Scout. I tried to get them up there, but they wouldn't let me take them. Next slide. So I, t I flew on two flights, STS-122 and STS-129. And both Sonny and Kevin and I trained together. Sonny was in my class in the 1998 astronaut class. So I, I got a degree in chemistry. I went and got a, ma a master's degree in material science engineering. I worked as an engineer for 11 years at NASA Langley. And then I applied to the astronaut corps. And I got into the astronaut corps. My first flight was in 2008. We took up um, the European Space Agency's laboratory. Next slide. And I think the most incredible part of this mission was we had our friends from Canada talking about the Canada arm. If you look at that top white piece, that's the Canada arm. How many of you play video games? Most of you, right? So if you can play video games, if you're experts at playing video games, you can fly the robotic arm. All of our training is done in a simulator, just like your video game is a simulator, right? Nintendo, Xbox, PlayStation, Wii, what else? DS, PS2, PS3, okay, all your games you play, you will be expert robotic arm operators if you can work that game. So that's what I did. I installed this onto the International Space Station. We grew the space station by another module. Next slide. And then after this installation, we had this wonderful meal. If you look at this picture, we have people from all around the world, African American, Asian American, French, German, Russian, the first female commander of the International Space Station. So as you saw, Sonny is now the female commander of the International Space Station. The first one was Dr. Peggy Whitson. And we're having this meal traveling around the planet at 17,500 miles per hour. Every 90 minutes, there is a sunrise and a sunset every 45 minutes. That's what space is like. You see things from 
blue lagoons to volcanoes erupting to brown mountains to just beautiful, beautiful landscape. And so this picture here, we're having a meal. Dan's floating up at the top like a bat. And if you look over to the left on the screen, you see there's some hot sauce. How many people like hot sauce? Because in space, your taste buds aren't as sensitive. Some people's taste buds aren't as sensitive. So we spice the food up a little bit. Next slide. And I took my Detroit Lions jersey to space. It was floating around. We played football in space. How many of you played football before? Some of you? Well, try to play that in space. The thing is, you've got to push off and float and tackle people, and you keep floating until you hit something like a wall. OK? Not good. Next slide. My second mission, STS-129, we flew up with um, our crew, a couple of Marines, and uh, Butch Wilmore, Scorch in the front. There's uh, Comrade. And if you look in the back right, there's Dr. Peggy Whitson, who is now the chief of the astronaut office. So she went from being the commander of the space station to being the chief of the office. So ladies, as you know, you can do it just like the men, right? Next slide. I'm going to show you a quick little movie about what it's like to work and live in space. Sonny and Kevin were doing some flips and showing you a few things, but I'm going to show you what it's like to fly and work in space. About, if you can kill the sound on that, if about three and a half hours before we launch, we're sitting in this vehicle. And I'm, see that window on the right? I'm at the bottom, the bottom of the window. I'm strapped in, I'm on my back, and we're waiting to actually launch into space. So, it, Sonny said it takes about eight and a half minutes to get to space. So the time that you're preparing about a year in advance to get you ready, all these people, thousands of people from around the world are focusing and working to help you get ready to go to space. It only takes you eight and a half minutes to get there. And we had, um, we had this uh, spare parts in the payload bay. We had to use the robotic arm. We had a number of other things we had to do. We were going to bring back our, our, uh, our colleague, Nicole Stott, because she was in space for four months. So we're bringing her back. I think we're having some technical difficulties, so you always have to be prepared for your backup plan, right? What's your, what's your backup plan? You got a backup plan? Okay, well, think about your backup plan. If one thing doesn't work out, you'll be ready for something else. Launch directors in Houston, I mean, in, in Florida, getting us ready. The countdown, three, two, one, liftoff. We've got a number of people um, around the area taking pictures, getting the orbiter ready. Um, as you see, Space Shuttle Atlantis, which we have retired now, which is going to end up in Florida. It's sitting on the runway and on the launch pad there. I think we're counting down to 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. I'm a little early, huh? 10, 9, 8, 7, Here we go. 6, 5. Help me count. 5, 3, 2, 1. Lift off. So if you look at this picture, I'm in, the, I'm in the back on the right, and you see my wrist. I'm holding my wrist up in the air. I've got a mirror on my wrist that I'm actually looking out the window, the overhead window, and I can see back down to the ground. And the plume makes a connection with the ground, connects to us, and I can see where my family and friends are sitting down on the ground. It's, it's an incredible moment. After two and a half minutes, the solid rocket boosters get jettisoned. And so eight and a half minutes later, we are now in space. The external tank, the orange tank, falls back down to the earth. It burns up, falls into the ocean. So after docking, and now we start doing our work. So we had a lot of spare parts to add to the space station. As you know, the space shuttle has retired. So we use the robotic arm, both the Canada arm one and two. One's on the shuttle, the other one's on the space station. So we're using that to put these spare parts up there so when the shuttle retires, we can actually use the arm in space to attach these parts to the space station. So that's what you see there. This side is on the, on the robotics workstation on the station side, and this is the Canada Arm 1 on the shuttle side. We use targets just like you do in your video games. Here's my football game in space. Boom! I took a hit, you know? Stupid astronaut tricks, we're eating our food. In space, you transfer things with your feet. Pull yourselves with your hands, because if you're using your hands to hold something in both hands, as soon as you get to a, a place, you've got to slow yourself down. So here's Randy doing the Superman maneuver. Look, Mom, no hands. <laughs> Food's very important in space. We had our Euro night, so a lot of our colleagues from around the world were sharing their 
delicacies from around the world. We had our, our Russian colleagues. Here's Nicole in the purple shirt. We brought her home. There's me floating food to my mouth, as usual. There's Bobby. There's Randy floating food to his mouth. So those are the kind of things you can do with your food in space. Mike and, and everyone else is saying, mm-mm, good. Nicole was the last transfer item. We transferred her over. She was item number 414. I asked the ground how much she was supposed to weigh. They said, you don't ask that. <laughs> Here's playing with your food in space, M&Ms and water bubbles. This is chemistry. This is surface tension. This is physics and chemistry at work in play. The gravity starts to build back up as we come home, so I'm dropping my book. My arms feel really, really heavy. I've been in microgravity for all this time, and now the gravitational pull of the Earth and the Gs we're pulling as we come back down to the ground make it really hard to move your arms and to flip the switches. At about 300 knots, Butch Wilmore, he's the pilot. His, his really important job is to flip the switch to let the landing gear down. As you see, he did a great job. We came home, we've been in space for about 13 days. As you see on the inset on the right, the wheels heat up quite a bit because all that energy that we were in space with has now got to be dissipated down on the ground. Parachute comes out, helps us rotate back onto the uh, tarmac there. And we have been in space for four, 13 days and travel over 4.9 million miles. So if I could only have half of those frequent flyer miles, I'd be set, right? Let's go to the next slide. After a couple hours, we kind of decondition ourselves. Um, you know, you take a lot of fluids, use the bathroom, those kind of things. Get your space legs, get your sea legs back and uh, walk around. Here's the space station assembly complete. Sonny was talking to you from, I think, the US laboratory. So that's back on the other side. Next slide. This is the, this is the atmosphere that keeps us alive on the planet. This is called the, the uh, Earth limb. And you see a sunset here. Next slide. Here's Sonny. Big hair and eating chicken with chopsticks. Next slide. Sonny and I, she mentioned her dog, Gorby. Sonny and I had two dogs, and our dogs were actually on the dog whisperer. So you see Sonny there with her dog, Gorby, and there's my dog there, Scout, and we were trying to get them to get along on the ground. Next slide. NASA is the place for everyone. How many of you have done robotics before? Any robotics operators in here? Lego robotics? Well, ro robotics are very important. When we want to get that, we have this rover on Mars right now. So think about trying to do things with your hands, building and creating. Like I made that skateboard. Think about the things that you can build to help society. Next slide. Legos. We have Legos in space right now. We have assembled Legos and curriculum for teachers to actually teach space physics using Legos. Next slide. Oh wait, who has a smartphone? How many of you have a smartphone? Okay, there's an app called the Astro app that my niece Sierra, when I came home, she showed me that she's gonna be an astronaut. She believes one day she's gonna be an astronaut, so she put herself in this astronaut uniform. So the things that you wanna do with your lives, find the people that are doing them now. And and try to understand how, what their path was and make that path your own. Next slide. Curiosity on Mars. How many, of you know, how many of you know about Curiosity on Mars? It's a rover that's looking for past signs of life on Mars. It's got a robotic arm. It's got all kinds of sensors for making measurements. It's pretty cool. Next slide. How many of you play Angry Birds? Most of you play Angry Birds. OK. So if you play Angry Birds, think about this. This is one little thing I want to leave you with. I've got a smartphone. I have Angry Birds on this phone. Angry Birds Space, in three days, listen to this, three days sold 10 million copies for 99 cents. So if, what's your name? Steven? Javon. Javon. If Javon had developed Angry Birds Space, you'd be a multimillionaire. Think about it. So instead of being a user of the technology, be a developer. Create the technology, and you will not only help advance our civilization, you will get paid too. And you can take all of us to Disney World. <laughs> but seriously though, you're playing these games, you're experts, you're masters at playing the games. Think about how you can be creators and developers of this technology. Next slide. How many of you know Will I Am? 
Okay, well, I am. We, he wrote a song called Reach for the Stars. We beamed the song to the rover on Mars and beamed it back to let students know about how these satellites and how this deep space network can actually send things like music from another, from another planet. And so that's all science and physics and math. So if you know those things, if you want to be a musician, you also have to know digital signal processing and all these things that when you make your, when you make your music and your MP3 files, that's all technology. Next slide. International Space Station Education, we have apps that you can download, data coming directly from space stations. So the things that Sonny and Kevin are doing in space, you can actually monitor them on the ground on your smartphone. Next, step, next slide. And then STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. It's very important. That's the future of ensuring that we have a strong economy, that we have a creative civilization that's going to allow us to be the next generation of explorers. So you guys in here, as Sonny mentioned, are those next generation of explorers. Do you believe that? Oh, come on. That's weak. Can you, do you believe that? Yes. I still can't hear you. Do you believe that? Yes. Okay, who's going to Mars one day? What does it take to get to Mars? Hard work. What else? Okay, what else? Dedication. What else? Teamwork. What else? You say eat your green beans? Yeah, Tony mentioned you got to be healthy, you got to be strong. If you're not strong and healthy, when you get to space, in the shade, it's minus 250 degrees. In the sun, it's positive 250 degrees. So your body in your spacesuit has to be able to handle all of these different things. So your health is very important in space, as it is on the ground, too. Next slide. So we talked about the student space, space flight experiment program. As I mentioned, Sonny's going to bring back these experiments. The students that have worked on this are going to be future scientists and engineers astronauts, whatever you want to be, but it starts with right now, getting exactly what you need right now to be that next generation of explorers. Next slide. How many people have ever said something to you like this, that you can't do something? Has anyone ever told you that you can't do something? People have told me that my whole life. They've told me, I can't do this. You can't play in the NFL. You can't be a football player. You can't be a scientist. You can't be an engineer. I've been told that. You know the problem with you can't? What's the problem with you can't? It's an apostrophe and a T. Next slide. Because if you take away the apostrophe and a T, it becomes you can. Don't let anyone bully you. Don't let anyone tell you that you can't achieve your dreams because you can do anything you put your mind to. You believe that? Yes. Come, uh, do you believe that? Yes. All right, next slide. So live your dreams. I appreciate what you're doing. I want to see some of you walking on the Martian surface one day. I want to thank General Daly at the Smithsonian, Tony Miller from the Department of Education. We have some other friends here from uh, Challenger Centers, Lance, and a number of other people here from Discovery Education, Kelly Denson. But I just want to thank everyone for having an investment in your future, because you are truly the future of our civilization. Thank you very much. God bless. All right. Up next is the director for the National Center for Earth and Space Science Education, Dr. Jeff Goldstein. Dr. Jeff is responsible for overseeing the creation and delivery of national science and education initiatives with a focus on Earth and space. In addition, his planetary science research includes the development of techniques for measuring global winds on other planets using large telescopes here on Earth. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Jeff Goldstein. Hello, DCPS. Hello. Hello to all of the students across the country and in Canada. Can, can I hear you? So it's a virtual cheer, right? It's a virtual cheer. Well, I thought I would take a few minutes to talk about the Student Space Flight Experiments Program. We're very proud of this initiative. 
And I think the, the best way to start is to say that it was all based on something very fundamental, which is that we humans are born to explore. We humans are born curious. And, and just to make that point, every parent remembers that very magical time when their child was just capable of expressing themselves, just capable of speaking. And every parent remembers the questions started at that moment. Question after question, an unending stream of questions from that child, which is, which is something that children are wired to do. We are born to ask those questions. We are born curious. And just as an aside, next time a child comes with you with this barrage of questions, take it as a gift because they chose you. And so not only are we born curious, but we also have another capacity as humans, which is that we're born evidence-based learners. Ever, ever since we are capable of interacting with our corner of the universe, our world, we like to poke it and see what happens. And we look at evidence of, of that interaction because that allows us to learn. Evidence allows us to learn how the world works. So curiosity and evidence-based learning are innately human. We are born that way. So how does that hook up with science as practiced by professional scientists and engineers using an inquiry approach to the world which we call the scientific method? Well, it's kind of interesting because science as practiced by professionals is nothing but organized curiosity. And science is evidence-based learning for the entire human race. Science, as it is practiced by professionals, grows organically from what it means to be human. And so if, if what we are grows into science naturally, that speaks to what science education ought to be in the 21st century. Um, we believe that we've got to stop teaching science with a focus on the book of knowledge. Because if science education is about introducing our next generation to science, we have to recognize that science was never a book of knowledge. Science has always been a journey. It's a process. It's a wondrously human, emotional journey. And it all starts with the gift of a question. And the scientist will hone this art form in terms of how to get from a question in, in search of an answer by navigating through the noise of the universe around us. And if you ask that gift of a question and you get to an answer, which, may, which, which is, is akin to pulling back the veil of nature and seeing something wholly new, it might be wholly new to you, it might be wholly new to the human race, but regardless, the act of that exploration is wondrous, and you can't help but have a smile break across your face. And it propels you to ask more questions because this is a, this is a lifelong experience. So if, if science is process, and science education ought not to focus on um, the book of knowledge as science, because that's a misconception that we're providing the public, Science education also ought not be about talking at science, talking about science, because our students, our children, are perfectly capable of being researchers right now. They do it every day. They survive on a daily basis the world, uh, the world around them. They are capable of being immersed in the journey in science, and that's what science education ought to be in the 21st century. So that's how we, this program got its, its start from a philosophical vantage point. And so to put the, you know, the rubber on the road, the question was, what could we offer to, to, to the United States? What could we offer internationally to give this opportunity to our children? And we wanted some opportunity that would be so powerful, so high visibility, so out of this world, that it would grab kids by the collar and teachers by the collar and say, how could you not do this? And so what we did was we worked with a company called Nanorax, which is working with a Space Act agreement with NASA to utilize the International Space Station as a national laboratory and open up commercial access. And we're able to say to a community, a school district, we're going to give you a real microgravity research mini laboratory and all launch services to get it to the International Space Station, and an astronaut will operate it as overseeing that payload. And so 
the, the school and, and, and the mini lab can contain a single experiment. And the school district now has this wonderful, professional, valuable, but limited resource. And so the school system says to hundreds of students across the district, break into teams like real researchers. Each team design your own real research program, a real experiment, which could be over a wide range of disciplines. It could be mi microbial, it could be protein crystal growth, food preservation, microaquatic life. Um, it's their research. They own it. They're empowered to ask the questions that they want to see an answer to. And they design a real experiment con constrained by the operation of that mini lab, which is used by professional researchers, and constrained by flight operations to and from low Earth orbit so that we, we work directly with NASA <coughs> through nanoracks. And each of these teams writes a real proposal, a formal proposal for what they want to do just like professional researchers. They go through a formal two-step proposal review process, just like professional researchers, and one of those experiments is selected for flight. It goes through a NASA flight safety review at toxicology at Johnson Space Center, and the entire community rallies behind the team that's going into space on behalf of that community. So right now, there are 23 experiments aboard the International Space Station that have been overseen by Commander Williams since it got there on the SpaceX-1 Dragon vehicle. And those 23 experiments represent over 7,000 students fully immersed in experiment design and proposal writing across the U.S. We, we received for this particular flight opportunity over 2,000 proposals. And right now, in 24 of the 55 SSEP communities across the country and in Canada, 24 of those communities are tuned into this video conference. And there are 9,500, and Jack, it was 57? 9,557 students out there. And so, um, on behalf of all of those students, to all of the teacher facilitators that made this happen in all of those communities, to all of the administrators, to the over 280 partner organizations that made this happen, including 26 space grant lead institutions, to NASA, to NANORACS, to the National Air and Space Museum and the Smithsonian, to the Center for the Advancement of Science and Space, our national partners, on behalf of those students, thank you. All right, our final guest is Assistant Secretary for Education and Access for the Smithsonian Institution, Claudine Brown. Claudine is responsible for defining the Smithsonian's education program. She oversees two of the Smithsonian's educational organizations, the National Science Resources Center and the Smithsonian Center uh, for Education and Museum Studies, as well as coordinating 32 education-based offices in museums and science centers. Ladies and gentlemen, Assistant Secretary Claudine Brown. Thank you. So first, I would like to say thank you to this audience, and I'd like for you to give yourselves a round of applause, all of you. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about what I've learned from you and about you today that make you pretty spectacular. First of all, you ask impressive questions, and you ask them for yourselves, and you ask them for your peers, and we all learned from what you had to ask. So thank you for every school, every student who came up with questions to ask of the astronauts who were with us today. The second thing that I'd like to thank you for is information about yourselves. When Leland spoke, how many of you said that you played sports? Can you raise your hands again? Thank you. So here's what we know about that. We know that those of you who play sports know how to behave as a team. You know how to support one another. You know how to block for one another, and you know how to facilitate someone else's successes because one person's success is a success for each of you. And that is a skill set that you will use in the sciences as well as in sports. 
So we commend you for that, and we encourage you to know and understand that very little of what you learn is not going to be useful. So Leland also mentioned the fact that many of you play video games. Can you raise your hands if you're playing video games? So what does that have to do with today? Again, you are mastering skills that can play a part in your lives if, as scientists if that is the direction you choose to move in. So when you play video games, you go from one level to the next. You know when you've made achievements, and you aspire to move to the next highest level. And that, too, will be a part of the work that you do in the future. And even though it may seem like play, when you love your work, your work feels like play. So we want you to know that when you pursue careers in the sciences, it will also be fun, as was exhibited for us today. And the final thing that I would say to you is, is that many of you are here today because you are a part of the SSEP experiments, which means that you are really pursuing your dreams. You're doing experiments, and you have thought of experiments that were done in space, and we will all learn from your questions. So we want to thank you for coming up with great experiments. So on behalf of Wayne Clough, the secretary of the Smithsonian Institution, and General Jack Daly, who is the director of this museum, and all of the teachers who work with you, and our colleagues from NASA, we want to thank you for helping us to learn from you. And we want to thank you for supporting your friends and peers in their pursuits. I think that you're pretty awesome. Thank you for being here. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our program for today. I'd like to thank our participants, Director General Jack Daly, Deputy Secretary Tony Miller, Commander Sonny Williams, Colonel Jeff Ford, Associate Administrator Leland Melvin, Center Director Jeff Goldstein, and Assistant Secretary Claudine Brown. I'd also like to thank NASA, the National Center for Earth and Space Science Education, the U.S. Department of Education, and all of the wonderful SSEP communities out there who made this program possible. We hope you enjoyed the program. Thank you very much. This is Mission Control Houston. The last week of the International Space Station's Expedition 33 has been focusing on getting three of the crew members ready to return to Earth. After more than four months on orbit since their launch in mid-July, Station Commander Sonny Williams, Flight Engineers Yuri Malenchika, and Aki Hoshide will be coming home Sunday evening U.S. time. Each day this past week, each of the three of them has had several blocks of time on their schedule set aside for departure preparation. That involves packing up their personal gear, closing out some experiment operations, packing those returning items into the Soyuz, as well as testing the Soyuz systems itself. They've also ramped up their daily exercise so they'll be in good shape to encounter gravity. For Malenchenko, some of that exercise was done wearing the lower body negative pressure suit. That's a Russian protocol that uses a suit and air pressure to simulate gravity by pulling on his lower extremities. Hoshide had his last session with the Integrated Cardiovascular Experiment, which tries to quantify cardiac atrophy of the crew members during a long-duration spaceflight. Uh, he also did exercise for the SPRINT investigation, which is looking to find out if high-intensity exercise done in shorter spurts is better for fighting bone and muscle loss than long sessions of just moderate exercise. On Monday, and again on Friday, Williams, Malenchiko, and Hoshide suited up in their launch and entry suits and conducted uh, Soyuz descent drills as they get prepared to come home. Station maintenance continued all during the week, even for the departing crew members. Williams and Hoshide set up hardware for an upgrade to the wireless access points for the station's onboard computer network. Flight engineer Kevin Ford was also busy in maintenance this week, 
changing out a valve and a water recovery system, installing radiation area monitors throughout the station, and installing a sensor kit for taking measurements of ultrasonic background noise. That's for an investigation that seeks to develop technology that will be able to listen for a pressure leak on board the station. To do that successfully, the system would need to know what a non-leak noise sounds like, and that's the uh, goal of the uh, sensor kit that Ford was installing. Leaving uh, the station didn't reduce the commitment of the crew members to uh, sharing their experience of space flight. On Wednesday, Hoshide answered questions about the flight posed by college students who were gathered at the uh, Scuba Space Center. And on Thursday, uh, Williams and Ford talked with elementary and secondary school students at the National Air and Space Museum as part of National Education Week activities. The crew continued its work while ground teams were planning a Friday morning firing of engines on the uh, 49 Progress in a debris avoidance maneuver to nudge the station away from a possible conjunction with an unidentified piece of space junk. What would be the second debris avoidance maneuver in a little more than two weeks' time would not have any effect on the plans for the weekend Soyuz undocking and landing. A ceremony marking the change from Expedition 33 to Expedition 34 is scheduled for Saturday at 1.15 p.m. Houston time. Expedition 34 officially begins and Kevin Ford becomes space station commander when Sonny Williams departs the station. And that should take place at 4.26 p.m. on Sunday afternoon. NASA TV will provide live coverage of the change of command ceremony, the final farewell and hatch closure, and the departure of Williams, Malenchenko, and Hoshide from the station on Sunday afternoon, as well as their landing in northern Kazakhstan Sunday evening U.S. time to wrap up a 127-day long space adventure. We hear you loud and clear aboard the International Space Station. Welcome aboard. The Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum's Moving Beyond Earth Gallery was among 25 North American locations at which participants of the Student Spaceflight Experiments Program, or SSEP, plugged into life on board the International Space Station during a live video conference with the ISS. The event gave U.S. and Canadian students an opportunity to ask station crew members about daily activities on board the orbiting laboratory. What advice can you give young kids like me about pursuing our dreams? Just have your eyes wide open and get ready for all those challenges because they'll be out there, but they'll be fun. And uh, the rewards are great if you try hard, work hard, and do your best. A panel of space flight and science experts also fielded questions, including astronaut Leland Melvin, NASA's Associate Administrator for Education. The SCEP program is a joint venture between the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum, the National Center for Earth and Space Science Education, NASA, and the U.S. Department of Education. One, two, three. A new NASA service will help sky watchers pinpoint where and when the International Space Station will make an appearance in the skies above them. NASA's Spot the Station service sends a text or email to anyone with an email account or an SMS-enabled phone to alert them when the ISS is scheduled for a flyover in their area. Mission Control at the Johnson Space Center compiles sighting opportunities for 4,600 locations worldwide. To sign up, visit spotthestation.nasa.gov. If your city or town isn't listed, just pick one that's close by. Hi, I'm Ashwin Vasavada. I'm the Deputy Project Scientist for the Curiosity Rover, and this is your Curiosity Rover Update. A lot of what this mission is about is figuring out the possibility that ancient Mars was a habitable environment. But we're also studying the present environment. Two instruments that help with that are the RAD instrument and the REMS instrument. The RAD instrument is a radiation assessment detector measures the high energy radiation coming in from the cosmic rays and the sun. That radiation is changed as it goes through Mars atmosphere to where we detect it on the surface. These measurements are helping to understand what the environment's like on the surface so that future astronauts will know how they can protect themselves from this harmful radiation. Another instrument that Curiosity has that measures the modern environment is called the Rover Environmental Monitoring Station. It's basically our weather station. We measure a lot of things, including pressure and humidity, temperature, and wind. It's been seeing little dips in pressure around noon, 
uh, that seem like the signature of dust devils. Only thing is, our pictures haven't turned up any dust devils. Spirit and Opportunity saw lots of dust devils moving across the horizon. Our best guess at what's going on is that Curiosity is seeing dust devils go right over it. So what we think is happening is the same sorts of vortices uh, driven by convection are occurring on Mars at Curiosity site, but just not picking up dust. Another thing that RIMS has been measuring is winds. Turns out we're in a pretty interesting place inside of Gale Crater. We're right at the base of a five kilometer high mountain to the south of us, and then there's a pretty tall crater rim to the north of us. And we're sitting kind of in a flat depression between the two. Uh, the winds blow up and down the mountain as the temperature changes during the day and up and down the crater slopes, and then along the depression where we're at. Uh, so right now we're trying to figure out from the REMS data exactly which parts of that wind field we're measuring. With Thanksgiving coming up, we've been preparing a few days worth of commands to send up to the rover to keep it busy while people here take some much needed time off. The rover will be acquiring a big panorama of our surroundings while we're away. I'm Ashwin Vasavada, and this has been your Curiosity Rover Update. NASA has announced the successful completion of the Kepler Space Telescope's baseline mission to search for planets in other solar systems. Since its launch in 2009, Scientists using Kepler have identified more than 100 exoplanets and another 2,300 plus candidates. The tapestry of everything that goes on at the Kepler, it's a really a team mission. It's an enormous number of people who come together to make this kind of a mission happen. In April of this year, NASA awarded the Kepler mission up to four more years of funding, allowing the telescope to continue its planetary census and to help scientists better understand solar system and planetary formation. Engineers at the Marshall Space Flight Center are using a new cost-saving method to create intricate metal parts for America's next heavy lift rocket. Called selective laser melting, the process uses a high energy laser to melt a fine metal powder into a computer-aided design pattern. A hybrid of 3D printing and artistic welding, SLM creates intricately designed parts with complex geometries that are more strong and safe in less time, saving millions in manufacturing costs. These new SLM created parts will be on the first SLS test flight in 2017. The Goddard Space Flight Center hosted a 2012 Veterans Day recognition program with former NASA astronaut and retired Navy Captain Scott Altman serving as featured speaker. Altman, who flew four space shuttle missions and commanded STS-125, the final Hubble servicing mission, praised those who defended and upheld those freedoms upon which our nation stands. All right. All right. now move it to the Hundreds of students celebrated the 20th annual Young Astronauts Day at the Glenn Research Center. They competed in a variety of activities testing their skills in science and engineering. Meeting with the students was Center Director Ray Lugo and NASA astronaut and Ohio native Greg Johnson, who serves as Associate Director of External Programs at Glenn. This year's event was sponsored by Glenn's Exploration Flight and Development Project Office and the Northern Ohio section of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Providing support was the center's Educational Programs Office. Thank you for joining us this evening. At the fifth annual Werner von Braun Memorial Symposium in Huntsville, Marshall Space Flight Center personnel and guests discussed a wide range of topics, including human space exploration, space commerce, national space security and policy, and trends in engineering education. The Von Braun Symposium, organized by the American Astronautical Society in conjunction with UA Huntsville, the National Space Club of Huntsville, and NASA, strives for the advancement of astronautics in the United States. Main engine start, six engines up and running, and liftoff. 14 years ago, on November 20th, 1998, Zarya, the first component of the new International Space Station, was launched atop a Russian proton rocket from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. During the initial assembly stage of the ISS, Zarya provided the station with propulsion, guidance, battery power, fuel storage, and rendezvous and docking capability for Soyuz and Progress space vehicles. Now that specialized components handle those chores for the station, Zarya is primarily used for storage. 
liftoff of Space Shuttle Atlantis, a mission to build, resupply, and to do research on the International Space Station. Three years ago, on November 16, 2009, Space Shuttle Atlantis rose skyward from the Kennedy Space Center on STS-129, an assembly flight to the International Space Station. Atlantis's crew consisted of Commander Charlie Hobaugh, Pilot Barry Wilmore, and Mission Specialist Bobby Satcher, Mike Foreman, Randy Bresnik, and Leland Melvin. Atlantis delivered parts to the space station, including a spare gyroscope and a UHF communications unit to be used for future station flights by SpaceX. The mission, the final space shuttle crew rotation flight to or from the space station, also returned to Earth NASA astronaut and station crew member Nicole Stott. Ein Tornado hat im Süden Portugals für Verwüstungen gesorgt. Die heftigen Winde führten zu Schäden an Häusern und Fahrzeugen. Acht Menschen wurden verletzt und mussten ins Krankenhaus gebracht werden. Die Algarve ist ein beliebtes Touristenziel. Tornados treten in Südeuropa nur selten auf. Im Nahen Osten stehen die Zeichen immer eindeutiger auf Krieg. Unsere Tagesthemen. Bomben auf Gaza, Israel vor möglicher Bodenoffensive. Misstöne in Moskau, Merkel-Besuch mit deutlichen Worten. Die Kämpfe zwischen Israel und radikal-islamischen Palästinensern, auch heute dauerten sie angeführt mit erbitterter Gewalt. Nach Tel Aviv gestern wurde heute sogar in Jerusalem Luftalarm ausgelöst. Eine Rakete, abgeschossen aus dem Gazastreifen, schlug in einem Außenbezirk ein. Ausgerechnet Jerusalem, diese für Juden, Christen und auch Muslime gleichermaßen heilige Stadt. Jerusalem ist aber auch der Sitz der israelischen Regierung. Die wiederum plant offenbar die Einberufung von mittlerweile 75.000 Reservisten und gab auch heute wieder den Befehl für massive Luftangriffe auf den Gazastreifen. Bernd Niebrügge über Tag 3 der neuen Gewalt in Nahost. Ost. Alarm in Tel Aviv. Wieder fliegen Raketen in Richtung der Metropole Israels. Menschen rennen in Panik zu den Bunkern, andere suchen Schutz in Gebäuden unter Bäumen, neben Autos. Dann die Explosion. Aufregung am Strand von Tel Aviv. Hier soll das zweite Geschoss der Hamas nur 200 Meter vom Strand entfernt ins Wasser geflogen sein. Und dass heute auch erstmals Jerusalem beschossen wurde, wusste bald jeder. Es ist schlimm, sagt diese junge Frau, aber wir müssen hier leben, haben keine Alternative. Und andere Israelis müssen mit ihren Kindern ja schon seit Jahren unter der Bedrohung leben. Während einer Beerdigung in Kiryat Malachi im Süden Israels muss sich die jüdische Trauergemeinde plötzlich unter einem Rohbau flüchten. Wieder Alarm, wieder schlagen Raketen aus Gaza ein. Dass ihre Bevölkerung ein Ende der Bedrohung will, wissen auch Premierminister Netanyahu und Präsident Peres, die sich heute zu einem Krisengespräch getroffen hatten. Der Präsident und ich haben mit vielen politischen Führern der Welt gesprochen. Sie haben Verständnis für unser Recht und unsere Aufgabe, die Bürger Israels zu schützen. Rund 16.000 Reservisten hat die israelische Armee inzwischen aktiviert. Aus dem ganzen Land werden Panzer, Material und Truppen rund um Gaza zusammengezogen. Folgt die Bodenoffensive ein neuer Gaza-Krieg? Mit ihren allein heute über 200 Luftangriffen schafft das israelische Militär für die Bevölkerung von Gaza schon jetzt eine Hölle. Mit jedem verletzten Kind, mit jedem Toten findet die radikal-islamische Hamas mehr Unterstützer für ihren Kampf. Sie hier stützen die Hamas und ihre Männer und Kinder werden es wohl auch tun. Solidarität zeigen. Diesen Auftrag hatte der ägyptische Regierungschef Hisham Kandil, als er heute Gaza besuchte. Er traf sich mit der Hamas. Kandil verschafft ihnen politische Unterstützung und gibt sich nicht als Friedensvermittler, sondern als Unterstützer der radikal-islamischen Gruppe. Das neue Ägypten steht hinter euch, bis die Palästinenser ihr Recht bekommen und ihren legitimen Staat gegründet haben. Wir werden alles tun, um die israelische Aggression zu beenden. Kandil muss wegen der Kämpfe vorzeitig Gaza verlassen, aber die Hamas hat seinen Besuch sicher gestärkt. Unser Israel-Korrespondent Richard Schneider ist in unmittelbarer Nähe zum Gazastreifen. Herr Schneider, fliegt die israelische Luftwaffe zur Stunde wieder Angriffe? Also jetzt unmittelbar in diesen Augenblicken nicht, aber vor einer halben Stunde haben wir ein paar Einschläge gehört hier in Gaza. Das hinter uns liegt, die Lichter, die Sie da hinter mir sehen, das ist Gaza. 
Also es wird ein bisschen weiter geflogen, allerdings ist es etwas ruhiger als in der gestrigen Nacht. Man muss davon ausgehen, dass weitere Angriffe heute Nacht noch erfolgen werden. Nun bereitet sich das israelische Militär ja unübersehbar auf eine Bodenoffensive vor. Wie wahrscheinlich ist es denn, dass die auch kommt? Also wenn man das so betrachtet, was wir um uns herum den ganzen Tag gesehen haben, dann muss man eigentlich davon überzeugt sein, dass diese Offensive kommt. Wir haben den ganzen Tag hier Panzer ankommen sehen. Wir wissen ja, dass mittlerweile 75.000 Reservisten eingezogen werden können. Das heißt ja noch nicht, dass sie eingezogen werden. Die Generäle haben gesagt, wir sind bereit, wir wollen einmarschieren. Die Politiker reden ganz ähnlich, weil sie sagen, wenn jetzt nicht bald diese Raketenangriffe der Hamas aufhören, dann haben wir gar keine andere Wahl. Also es scheint so dass diese Offensive tatsächlich kommen wird. Nur, was geschieht denn dann? Und die große Frage ist, wenn einmarschiert wird, wird das wieder aus israelischer Sicht so einfach sein wie vor vier Jahren beim Gaza-Krieg. Und wenn man sich wirklich in einen schlimmen Bodenkampf verwickelt, wenn es wirklich zu massiven Kämpfen mit viel Blutvergießen kommt, dann wird vor allem Ägypten immer weiter in die Enge geraten, weil dann muss der Muslimbruder Präsident Morsi ja irgendwie Farbe bekennen. Er hat ja auch heute sich wieder an die Seite der Hamas gestellt. Und was bedeutet das dann für das israelisch-ägyptische Verhältnis? Also viele, viele Fragen und viele, viele Sorgen hier bei vielen Menschen. Deutsche Kanzler und russische Staatsmänner. Dieses Verhältnis war in den vergangenen 25 Jahren meist eines von großer Zuneigung, selbst am Ende des Kalten Krieges. Kohl pflegte gute Kontakte zu Gorbatschow, ging mit Jelzin sogar in die Sauna und Schröder und Putin verbindet bis heute eine testosterontriefende Männerfreundschaft. Nur Schröders Amtsnachfolgerin Merkel und Russlands schon wieder Präsident Putin werden nicht so recht warm miteinander. Oder vielleicht doch wenn man eine gute Beziehung auch daran misst, inwieweit man sich gegenseitig offen ins Gesicht sagen kann, was man an dem anderen nicht so toll findet. Udo Lelischkis über die deutsch-russischen Regierungskonsultationen in Moskau. Das dürfte dem Kreml heute nicht gefallen haben. Empfang in der Residenz des deutschen Botschafters für die Mitglieder der russischen Zivilgesellschaft, die es nicht zu Angela Merkel in den Kreml geschafft hatten. Dort waren sie nicht eingeladen. Gedankenaustausch also mit denen, die den Kurs des russischen Präsidenten Putin für einen Feldzug gegen die Opposition halten. Es war ein kalter Moskauer Wind, der der Kanzlerin bei ihrer Ankunft entgegenblies. Empörte und wütende russische Reaktionen auf die kremlkritische Bundestagsresolution hatten schon gestern den deutsch-russischen Dialog bestimmt. Heute dann zunächst Appelle von jungen Teilnehmern für mehr deutsch-russischen Jugendaustausch und Visaerleichterungen. Doch dann übte die Kanzlerin ungewöhnlich deutliche Kritik an harten Gesetzen gegen Oppositionelle und am harschen Pussy Riot Urteil. Okay, das würde auch in Deutschland eine Diskussion hervorrufen, wenn so etwas in einer Kirche passieren würde, gar keine Frage. Aber ob man dafür zwei Jahre in ein Arbeitslager muss als junge Frau, das weiß ich nicht. In Deutschland wäre es jedenfalls so nicht gewesen. Wladimir Putin wies zwar den Vorwurf zurück, gezielt gegen die Zivilgesellschaft vorzugehen und er machte ebenfalls kritische Bemerkungen in Richtung Berlin. Doch von einer düsteren Atmosphäre in den deutsch-russischen Beziehungen wollte er nichts wissen. Wir haben Meinungsunterschiede, wir streiten, wir suchen Kompromisse, aber das ist keine düstere Atmosphäre. Unsere Freundschaft wird nicht besser und unsere wirtschaftliche Zusammenarbeit Zusammenarbeit wird auch nicht davon besser, dass wir einfach alles unter den Teppich kehren. Man kann sich also, und das ist die wirklich neue Qualität dieses Treffens, durchaus einmal sehr deutlich die Meinung sagen. Ohne, dass das unbedingt viel bewirkt, aber auch ohne dramatische Folgen für die Zusammenarbeit. Wie zum Beweis dafür unterzeichneten beide Seiten verschiedene politische Abkommen und milliardenschwere Lieferverträge. In Jaffa war eine laute Explosion zu hören. Soeben erst hatten die Israelis dafür ein neues Raketenabwehrsystem bei der Stadt stationiert, um die Bewohner vor Vergeltungsanschlägen der Hamas zu schützen. Unaufhaltsam steuern Israel und militante Palästinenser offenbar im Gazastreifen auf einen weiteren verheerenden Bodenkrieg zu. Am Morgen in Gaza-Stadt. Unter den Trümmern suchen sie nach Verschütteten. In der Nacht hat Israels Luftwaffe weiter angegriffen. Sie bombardierte unter anderem das Hauptquartier der Polizei und Regierungsgebäude der Hamas. Auch der Amtssitz von Regierungschef Haniya ist schwer beschädigt. Erst gestern war dort noch der ägyptische Regierungschef Kandil zu Besuch. Israel reagiert mit aller Härte auf den andauernden Raketenbeschuss aus Gaza. 
Die notwendigen Schritte, die wir ergriffen haben, sollen diese Gefahr beenden. Sie sollen die israelische Bevölkerung von dieser konstanten Gefahr von Raketen aus dem Gazastreifen befreien. Auch die Vorbereitungen auf eine Bodenoffensive haben längst begonnen. Unweit der Grenze zu Gaza sind Panzer aufgefahren. Und Reservisten werden mobilisiert. Bis zu 75.000 Israelis könnten zu den Waffen gerufen werden. Israel hat nach eigenen Angaben seit Mittwoch mehr als 800 Ziele im Gazastreifen angegriffen. Militante Palästinenser feuerten zeitgleich etwa 600 Raketen und Granaten Richtung Israel. Und mein Kollege Dirk Emmerich steht für uns an der Grenze zum Gazastreifen in der Stadt Aschdod. Dirk, erzählen Sie uns, wie ist denn die Lage vor Ort? Sehr angespannt. Wir hatten es gerade vor vier, fünf Minuten, Sie konnten das nicht mitbekommen, hatten wir hier einen Luftalarm und wir haben gesehen, wie Raketen durch die Luft geflogen sind. Wir wissen nicht, wo sie im Augenblick eingeschlagen sind. Die Sirenen haben wieder aufgehört, aber die Anspannung ist hier hoch. Und Sie haben es gerade erwähnt, ungefähr vor 25 Minuten gab es Luftalarm auch in Tel Aviv. Zwei Raketen waren im Anflug. Eine konnte entschärft werden, die zweite ist vermutlich ins Meer gegangen. Wie ist die Stimmung? Sie haben gesagt, sie ist sehr angespannt. Was ist denn zu erwarten in den nächsten Stunden, auch dort, wo Sie jetzt gerade stehen? Was meinen Sie? Wir sind den ganzen Tag heute hier in der Nähe des Gazastreifens unterwegs gewesen. Das, was wir im Bericht gerade gesehen haben, es sind sehr, sehr viele Soldaten unterwegs hierher in den Gazastreifen. Es sind auf jeden Fall über 10.000, die sich hier positionieren. Und wir haben auch sehr, sehr viele Panzer gesehen. Die Menschen hier rechnen tatsächlich damit, dass eine Bodenoffensive vorbereitet wird. Für viele ist vor allen Dingen mit den Angriffen, mit den Raketenangriffen auf Tel Aviv in den letzten Tagen und auch auf Jerusalem gestern die rote Linie überschritten. Und die Regierung kann sogar darauf hoffen, dass die, die, die Bevölkerung auch hier, wo ich mich befinde, voll dahinter steht. Man wird das Ganze äh, unterstützen. Herzlichen Dank für diese Informationen, Dirk Emmerich. Zwischen Israel und radikalen Palästinensern im Gazastreifen eskaliert weiter die Gewalt. Die israelische Armee beschoss den dritten Tag in Folge Gazastadt und die Umgebung. Nach Armeeangaben galten die Angriffe mit Raketen und Granaten 85 Terrorzielen. Dabei wurde auch das Hauptquartier der Hamas zerstört. Am Nachmittag feuerten auch die Palästinenser wieder Raketen Richtung Israel. In der Großstadt Tel Aviv wurde Luftalarm ausgelöst. Tel Aviv am späten Nachmittag. Den dritten Tag in Folge gibt es Alarm. Wieder wird eine Rakete aus dem Gazastreifen auf die Mittelmeermetropole abgefeuert. Die Menschen bringen sich in Sicherheit. Es macht mich atemlos. Ich hasse Kriege. Ich weiß nicht, wie wir in diese Situation gekommen sind. Wir sollten damit aufhören. Die israelische Raketenabwehr, erst wenige Stunden zuvor bei Tel Aviv stationiert, zerstört den feindlichen Flugkörper in der Luft. Zur gleichen Zeit verlegt Israel immer mehr Truppen in den Süden, beruft Reservisten ein. Offenbar ist eine Bodenoffensive geplant. Die Armee will die militärischen Stellungen der Hamas ausschalten. Wenn wir angegriffen werden, schlagen wir noch härter zurück. Niemand in Gaza soll sich sicher fühlen. Niemand, auch nicht Präsident Hanie. In den letzten 24 Stunden haben die Israelis den Gazastreifen massiv angegriffen. Die Hamas schwört Rache, will weiter kämpfen und ruft die arabische Welt zur Unterstützung auf. Wir wollen kämpfen bis zum Sieg. Der Feind wird verlieren. Israel wird seine Ziele bei dieser Militäroperation nicht erreichen. Auch das Büro des Ministerpräsidenten und die Polizeizentrale in Gazastadt werden zerstört. Es gibt wieder Tote und Verletzte. Vor allem die Zivilbevölkerung fürchtet sich jetzt vor einer möglichen Bodenoffensive. Im Süden Israels bleiben morgen die Schulen wieder geschlossen. Auch hier fürchten die Menschen eine Eskalation und weitere Raketeneinschläge. Zur aktuellen Situation jetzt live aus Tel Aviv unser Korrespondent Richard Schneider. Wir konnten heute auf den Schnellstraßen in Richtung Süden heute große Massen an eingezogenen Soldaten sehen, an Reservisten, die sich da in Richtung Grenze auf den Weg machten. Und es wurden auch weitere Panzer, viele Panzer hinuntergebracht in den Süden. Viele Menschen hier sind überzeugt, dass es zu einem Einmarsch der Bodentruppen kommen wird. Doch manche sagen, vielleicht ist das Ganze ja nur ein Bluff, um die Hamas einzuschüchtern, denn was würden wir dabei gewinnen? 
Immer mehr Stimmen sagen jetzt hier in Israel, möglicherweise ist das der große Fehler, den man machen könnte. Denn ein Einmarsch wird blutig, wird brutal. Die internationale Staatengemeinschaft wird sich gegen Israel wenden. Im Augenblick unterstützen uns noch alle. Vielleicht wäre es besser, weiter zu bombardieren und dem so versuchen, ein Ende zu machen, den vielen Raketenangriffen der Hamas. Und damit gebe ich zurück zu Jens Riva nach Hamburg. Weltweit hat die Verschärfung der Lage in Nahost Besorgnis ausgelöst. Bundeskanzlerin Merkel telefonierte mit Israels Premier Netanyahu und Ägyptens Präsident Mursi. Sie betonte das Existenzrecht Israels sowie die Notwendigkeit eines schnellen Waffenstillstands. Den Ägypter Mursi ermunterte Merkel weiter, eine wichtige Vermittlerrolle in dem Konflikt einzunehmen. Auch US-Präsident Obama sprach mit Netanyahu und Mursi, um nach Auswegen aus der Krise zu suchen. Die Bundeswehr steht möglicherweise vor einem NATO-Einsatz an der türkisch-syrischen Grenze. Nach Informationen des ARD-Hauptstadtstudios will Ankara das Bündnis offiziell um Aufstellung von Flugabwehrraketen des Typs Patriot bitten. Bei einer Zustimmung könnte sich die Bundeswehr mit bis zu 170 Soldaten beteiligen. Die Regierung prüfe, ob dafür ein Mandat des Bundestags nötig ist. Patriot-Flugabwehrraketen der Bundeswehr. Bald könnte so eine Einheit in der Türkei an der syrischen Grenze stehen. Wenn Ankara im Rahmen der NATO-Bündnispartnerschaft die Allianz um Hilfe bittet, dürfte sich die Bundesregierung solidarisch zeigen, so ARD-Informationen. Koalitionsmitglieder des Verteidigungsausschusses im Bundestag würden einem Einsatz zustimmen. Patriot äh, richtet sich gegen Angriffe von außen in Form von Raketen oder Flugzeugen zur Landesverteidigung. Hier könnten wir der Türkei Hilfestellung leisten. Doch sowohl in der Union als auch in der FDP plädieren Abgeordnete für eine Befragung des Parlaments. Weil ich glaube, dass bei der Entsendung von Soldatinnen und Soldaten in ein Konfliktgebiet, und das ist Syrien, die türkische Grenze zu Syrien zweifellos, sie natürlich eine breite politische Rückendeckung benötigen. Im türkisch-syrischen Grenzgebiet kam es aufgrund des syrischen Bürgerkriegs zu vereinzelten militärischen Zwischenfällen. Eine Verwicklung der Bundeswehr in Kampfhandlungen wäre bei einem Patriot-Einsatz möglich. Die Grünen warnen vor den Folgen und fordern weit mehr als ein Bundestagsmandat. Ob es klug ist, ohne UN-Mandat möglicherweise zum Bestandteil einer Kriegspartei in einem Bürgerkrieg zu werden, das ist eine andere Frage. Das kann dann nicht zur Stabilisierung, sondern zur weiteren Destabilisierung der Region führen. Dass die Türkei Kriegspartei werden könnte, sehen die Mitglieder der Koalition nicht. Denn bisher habe sich Ankara im Syrien-Konflikt zurückhaltend gezeigt. Die Welt blickt weiter besorgt nach Israel und auf den Gazastreifen. Den vierten Tag in Folge beschoss die israelische Armee heute Ziele in Gaza. Die Palästinenser ihrerseits feuerten wieder Raketen nach Israel. Seit Beginn der Luftschläge starben mehr als 40 Menschen. 350 sollen verletzt worden sein. Aus Israel Rachel Blufarb. Gazastreifen heute Mittag. Krankenwagen sind die einzigen, die hier noch fahren. 40 Tote, über 300 Verletzte, so die Bilanz nach dem vierten Tag des Krieges. Die Spirale der Vergeltung geht weiter. Israel rächt sich für die Anschläge der Hamas auf Tel Aviv und Jerusalem. Dieser Luftangriff galt Premierminister Hanier. Er überlebt, sein Regierungssitz geht in Flammen auf. Über 100 Familien sind im Gazastreifen inzwischen obdachlos. Ihr Zuhause liegt in Trümmern. Viele suchen nach brauchbaren Überbleibseln. Gleiches Leid auf der Gegenseite. Die Hamas schießt in den letzten zwölf Stunden 70 Raketen auf den Süden Israels ab. Dieses Haus in der Kleinstadt Ashdod wird zerstört. Vier Verletzte. Die Familie saß gerade beim Mittagessen. Wie ich mich fühle? Samstagmittag fliegt dir eine Rakete auf den Kopf? Ich habe zwei Kinder. Es ist schrecklich. Damit das aufhört, rüstet Israel weiter auf. Wir stehen hier direkt an der Grenze zum Gazastreifen. Panzer und Artillerie der israelischen Armee sind hier aufgefahren. Tausende Soldaten sind extra hierher kommandiert worden für einen eventuellen Einmarsch mit Bodentruppen in den Gazastreifen. Die Hamas zeigt sich unbeeindruckt. Auch heute wieder ein Raketenangriff auf Tel Aviv. Das neue Abwehrsystem verhinderte Schlimmeres. Okay, well, welcome to the 33-34 change of command ceremony today here on the Good Ship International Space, Space Station. Um, we're going to hand over today a command from myself to Kevin Ford. I uh, just wanted to reflect a couple things about our time up here and just time in history. Uh, 
sort of was brought to our attention on the 55th anniversary of Sputnik that that was sort of a cool event um, that we actually launched satellites from the Japanese portion of the space station on that day. So I got to thinking about what's been going on in the last couple years. Um, about 100 years ago, the Girl Scouts were founded, Oreos were founded. So those are significant events, and a lot of other really cool things happened all over the world at that point in time as well. Uh, national parks were founded. Um, a lot of great things all over the world, including aviation, started too. Uh, 50 years ago, I mentioned already, Sputnik um, was a pretty major event for all of us that got us here today. 25 years ago, Aki just graduated from high school. Yuri was flying airplanes, and I, in the United States, became legal drinking age. So a, bu a bunch of interesting half things happened 25 years ago. Um, 10 years ago, a little over 10 years ago, people were, became living on this International Space Station for a permanent pre presence. And um, we are honored to be uh, fulfilling that dream and living that dream right now. So I just wonder what is going to happen or what our future is, lies in store for us 10 years, 25 years, 50 years, and 100 years from now. I think we've left the ship in good shape, and I'm honored to hand it over to Kevin. Although he's an Air Force guy, so we have to make him a little more Navy because it is a ship. So I have a little present for him first. To, this is a Navy pennant that, if you hold this for a second, flies over uh, Navy ships when the commander is on board. So this is for you. Thank you very much, Sonny. And now, um, you know, the Gipa Baton came up, and uh, that was a, a, a idea from Yukini's daughter. And there's four of us living here in Node 2, and it's pretty crowded. The Gipa Baton is not lonely, but with two of us leaving, he might be lonely. And so I'm going to give him a friend. <laughs> Uh-oh. We know what to do with that. We know what to do with that. <laughs> and I'm not sure you guys know who um, uh, Magnum P.I. is, but... Oleg is our Magnum PI, and with that, he gets the traditional Hawaiian shirt that's been wow. on the ISS for quite some time. Thank you so much. So as you can see, we have a great crew up here, us who are going home uh, very shortly, and the ones who are taking over. Ship's in good hands. Uh, thank you very much. I, I hope you heard all of Sonny's words. They were, uh, they were very nice words, and uh, we do appreciate the gifts. Uh, we appreciate also the great handover we've gotten from you guys. It's been uh, relatively short, uh, not as, sh some, some have been shorter, but three weeks is a pretty short handover. And uh, between Oleg, uh, Yevgeny, and I, uh, we have all together, if you combine all of our space time, we have about three months total time in space so far. And if you combine the time of Sunny and Aki and Yuri, they have three years <laughs> of total time in space, living in space. So they really had a lot to offer us. We learned a tremendous amount from them, and they were really, really good about sharing it. Uh, we're not really ready to see them go, to be honest, but, uh, but it's time for them to get home. They need to land at a time when uh, the, the, the rescue forces can uh, get to them and find them easily and get them safely back to their families. Um, it's been a pleasure serving with them. Sunny said uh, she hopes she's left the station in great shape, and they have. The space station is in remarkably good condition. It's re ready uh, for full-up utilization. The exercise equipment is fantastic. The facilities are fantastic. Everything is in order. The ground teams are running uh, really well and harmoniously with the crew, and the training to get here has been great. So uh, we're ready for a great expedition. Uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll be here holding down the fort for uh, maybe four uh, uh, four or so weeks until the rest of the crew gets here to complement Expedition 34. And we're looking forward to doing a lot of science and getting a lot of utilization done uh, now that the space station is, uh, is fully up and ready to go. So thanks to everybody on the ground. Thanks to Sunny and her crew. Thank you for a great handover, and I'm ready to assume command of the International Space Station. You Thank you it. very much. <laughs> And Houston, that concludes the change of command ceremony. Thanks for coming, being on board with us.
Thank you so much. Uh, it was a great job, and uh, congratulations to both of you and to all of you. Trotz internationaler Bemühungen um eine Feuerpause im Gaza-Konflikt feuerten sowohl Israel als auch die Hamas heute Dutzende Raketen ab. Die Zahl der Toten stieg auf 72, davon allein 69 auf Seiten der Palästinenser. Und die Anzeichen für eine israelische Bodenoffensive in den Gazastreifen mehren sich. Rachel Blufarb berichtet. Sie ist mit dem Leben davongekommen. Retter bergen diese Frau und einen weiteren Mann aus den Trümmern ihrer Häuser in Gaza. Die Helfer selbst riskieren ihr Leben. Immer wieder rauschen Raketen heran. Zielen nach israelischen Angaben auf strategisch wichtige Anlagen der Hamas. Am Morgen wird ein Sendergebäude mitten in Gaza getroffen. Wichtige Kommunikationseinrichtungen des Feindes sollen hier zerstört worden sein, heißt es im Hauptquartier der israelischen Armee. Doch auch ausländische Medienvertreter waren hier untergebracht, unter anderem aus Deutschland. Es gibt Verletzte, bei weiteren Einschlägen auch Tote, getroffen werden auch immer wieder Zivilisten. Und das auf beiden Seiten. Die israelische Luftabwehr kann nicht jede Hamas-Rakete abfangen. Vor den Toren Tel Avivs gelingt ihr das. Trümmer stürzen jedoch zu Boden, setzen Autos in Brand. Andernorts schlagen die Geschosse direkt in Wohnhäuser ein. Grund genug für Israel, die Tonart zu verschärfen. Die Operation im Gazastreifen geht weiter und wir sind dazu bereit, sie noch bedeutend auszuweiten. Was Netanyahu damit meinen könnte, ist hier zu sehen. Wir wollen uns ein Bild von der Lage vor Ort machen, doch die Armee hält uns auf. Wir sind gerade auf dem Weg zur Grenze an den Gazastreifen. Für uns ist jetzt hier aber Schluss. Die israelische Armee hat Straßensperren aufgestellt, hat das ganze Gebiet von hier bis zur Grenze zum militärischen Sperrgebiet erklärt. Das deutet alles auf eine baldige Bodenoffensive hin. Ob das noch abzuwenden ist, entscheidet sich vielleicht morgen. Dann reisen UN-Generalsekretär Ban Ki-moon nach Kairo und Bundesaußenminister Westerwelle nach Israel, um mit beiden Seiten über eine Feuerpause zu reden. Die Gewalt zwischen Israel und den Palästinensern hält unvermindert an. Die israelische Armee griff erneut Ziele im Gazastreifen an. Radikale Palästinenser feuerten Raketen Richtung Israel. Am fünften Tag der Kämpfe stieg die Zahl der Toten auf 72. Die weitaus meisten Opfer gab es auf palästinensischer Seite. Die Bemühungen um eine Waffenruhe gehen indes weiter. Tel Aviv heute Abend wieder heulen die Sirenen zum zweiten Mal. Während Linienflugzeuge den Flughafen Ben Gurion ansteuern, vernichtet die israelische Raketenabwehr eine aus dem Gazastreifen abgefeuerte Rakete. Und auch der israelische Süden liegt weiter unter Beschuss. In Ashkelon und Ashdod suchen die Bewohner die Schutzräume auf. Jeder versucht jedem zu helfen. Unterdessen verstärkt Israel seine Gruppen in der Grenzregion. Die Vorbereitungen für eine mögliche Bodenoffensive sind fast beendet. Parallel gehen die diplomatischen Bemühungen um eine Waffenruhe weiter. Jetzt versucht der französische Außenminister Fabius zu vermitteln, bisher ohne Ergebnisse. Tatsache ist, dass die Hamas bisher alle Vorschläge abgelehnt hat, auch die von türkischer Seite und die von Katar. An uns liegt es also nicht. Die andere Seite verweigert sich. Auch im Gazastreifen hört man pausenlos Einschläge. Seit fünf Tagen greift die israelische Armee mit Raketen und Granaten an. In Gaza-Stadt wird dieses zweistöckige Gebäude zerstört. Es soll sich nach palästinensischen Angaben um ein Wohnhaus handeln. Mehrere Menschen sind offenbar getötet worden. Vertreter der Hamas lassen sich nicht blicken, schicken Kinder vor. Die Welt soll wissen, dass wir getötet werden sollen. Wir haben keine Kindheit. Wie sollen wir das alles aushalten? Ziel der Israelis ist es, das Waffenarsenal der Hamas zu zerstören. Die radikalen Palästinenser benutzen die Zivilbevölkerung aber als menschliche Schutzschilder. Deshalb verschanzen sich die Hamas-Kämpfer oft in Wohngebieten wie hier in der Nähe einer Moschee. Bilder der israelischen Armee. Die Bevölkerung im Gazastreifen lebt in ständiger Angst, in ständiger Gefahr. Die Krankenhäuser sind überfüllt, der Nachschub an Medikamenten soll knapp werden. Zur aktuellen Situation jetzt live aus dem Grenzgebiet zum Gazastreifen unser Korrespondent Richard Schneider. Wir haben hier vor einer guten halben Stunde etwa massive Truppenbewegungen gesehen, ganze Konvois von gepanzerten Militärfahrzeugen. Aber ob das der, die Vorbereitung für den eigentlichen Eimarsch ist, darf im Augenblick noch bezweifelt werden. Noch scheint hinter den Kulissen einem Waffenstillstandsabkommen möglicherweise der Vorrang gegeben werden. 
Denn Israel hat mit einem Einmarsch eigentlich nichts zu gewinnen, sondern nur zu verlieren. Selbst Militärs sagen mittlerweile, sie rechnen damit, dass sie dann, wenn sie einmarschieren müssten, mindestens sieben Wochen da drin bleiben müssten. Und das würde bedeuten, unglaublich viele Tote, wahnsinniges Blutvergießen auf beiden Seiten, diplomatische Niederlage an den Pranger gestellt werden Israels. Und das alles will man auf alle Fälle versuchen im Augenblick zu vermeiden, denn noch steht zumindest der Westen hinter Israels Angriff auf Gaza. Und damit gebe ich zurück zu Jan Hofer nach Hamburg. Wird das Wasser hier im Batemans Bay von den Tornado hochgezogen. Australien befindet sich gerade mitten in der Sturmsaison und die Behörden registrieren eine Zunahme heftiger Tornados mit starken Regenfällen im Schlepptau. In der Stadt Woodburn wurden Start zahlreiche Häuser zerstört. Es war, als seien zehn Güterzüge auf einmal durchs Haus gerast, erzählte ein Bewohner. of departing crew members made their way through the small passageway connecting Rasviad with the Soyuz TMA 05M spacecraft uh, before the hatches uh, were finally closed. Uh, the crew members saying goodbye to one another uh, for the final time. On Saturday, it was Williams who handed over command of the International Space Station to Ford, who will remain Expedition 34 commander until mid-March when Ford Uh, Novitsky and Torelkin come home after five months in space. Uh, Ford at that time will hand over command of the International Space Station to Canadian Space Agency astronaut Chris Hadfield, who will become the first Canadian to command the International Space Station. Undocking confirmed. I see the confirmation for the SSVP mode and also the separation. I see the separation straight without rotating. Undocking occurring on time at 4.26 p.m. Central Time over northwestern China. The indicator mode has uh, disappeared. We copy. And the uh, RSC Energia personnel in this video replay uh, just after landing, uh, opening up the hatch with a ratchet tool and uh, reaching inside uh, to uh, shake the hand of Soyuz commander Yuri Malenchenko, who is in the center seat, and uh, pulling out uh, from Malenchenko uh, some of the flight data file books uh, that he used uh, during uh, the procedures uh, prior to and during uh, the Soyuz's return to Earth. Uh, getting those out of the way and putting them in bags to be returned uh, to Moscow, uh, enabling uh, Malenchenko to be extracted from the capsule. We should be seeing that uh, very shortly. And a good view of uh, Yuri Malenchenko being extracted from uh, the center seat in the uh, Soyuz spacecraft. Malenchenko completing his fifth flight into space on a total of 642 days in orbit placing him seventh on the all-time space endurance list. Sonny Williams uh, now uh, in this video replay being extracted uh, from the left seat as the board engineer from the Soyuz vehicle. Aki Hoshide uh, obviously uh, was the last to be extracted. Sunny Williams uh, wrapping up uh, her second flight into space and a total of 322 days in space on her two missions. She conducted three spacewalks uh, to emerge uh, as the all-time uh, leading female in terms of spacewalking time. 
Another view now of Yuri Malenchenko uh, with a whopping 642 days in space on his five flights, putting him seventh on the all-time endurance list behind six other Russian cosmonauts. And congratulations on the landing. Just say a few words. How was the landing? Everything was fine. We didn't have any problems. Uh, the timing and the landing site, everything was... Aki Hoshide of the uh, Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency completing uh, his second flight into space. A total of 141 days in space for Hoshide, placing him third amongst all-time uh, Japanese space travelers behind uh, Soichi Noguchi and Koichi Wakata, who will launch in uh, late 2013, ultimately to become the first Japanese commander of the International Space Station. Things fine? Yeah. Hello. Coming over there. I'm doing good. I don't want to move too much. <laughs> you look good. I look all right. You look so happy. No, I don't. You haven't been eating. No, I have. Don't you worry. get you some pizza? Yeah, we do. Some good and greasy. Some beverages. <laughs> well, we'll see what we can do. All right. Then we can really get you some. Woo, woo, woo. Thank you. You look great. Thank you. Great job. I know, I know. Gary. How are you? No, I'm getting there. <laughs> no. Yuri, congratulations. Wonderful expedition. You were excellent. Excellent proof. No, what? Ну что, уважаемые, дорогие наши космонавты и астронавты, first of all, we would like to greet you here on Earth in Kazakhstan, uh, on our multicultural land on, at an international level, and we would like to wish you good health and wish you from Kazakhstan and give you from Kazakhstan these flowers from us to you. Um, wish you um, good spirits, good health, 
good health and I hope we are going to meet again and wish you all the best here on earth. This land is very welcoming and we are ready to greet you even when you're coming not just from space not from space have a look at our beautiful ladies that's what they have prepared for you our national costume and some uh, leaflets, some books about Kostanai, uh, some candy from Kostanai, so that your life was just as sweet as the candy and chocolate. <laughs> uh, dear friends, dear cosmonauts, dear astronauts, and I, as the representative of our aviation side department, would like to present you with um, this, these traditional uh, matryoshkas from the Russian Federation, from uh, Russian aviation, and each of them has their name, has your names on it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, picture. And uh, where is the Japanese delegation? Looking here, yes. And another one. <laughs> You're looking great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, guys. Sonny, just tell us how you're feeling um, now that you're home. Well, I'm uh, feeling great to be back on Earth, but feeling, of course, after coming back from space for a little while, you feel a little woozy. So <laughs> I'm a little tired. It was a long day and feeling not my 100 percent, but pretty good. OK, uh, let's talk about what you guys did on the expedition. You had an incredibly busy time. You had a lot of vehicles coming up there. You also had three spacewalks, which were quite uh, memorable. Talk about that. <laughs> So yeah, it was pretty busy up there. It was sort of one thing after another, and um, people asked how, how we were going to manage, and I think we just focused on one event and, and then led to the next event. So it, so it was exciting. There wasn't a, a lot of downtime, and whenever we did have any downtime, we got to do a lot of good science, and that's what the space station's now in the utilization phase. So that was that was really was really rewarding. It was one thing, uh, like I said, after another, but it was all a lot of fun, and I can't say enough about the crew that I was with. They were great. And we all had made it a lot of fun together. So what's whenever you look back at your expedition, what's going to be the, the main thing that you remember about it? Gosh, there's just too many things to pick out. It's hard to pick out one. The spacewalks were, of course, incredible. Um, you know, started off just thinking it was going to be a bolt replacement, essentially, and it, it grew into a couple more after that. And uh, particularly the radiator uh, uh, change out was, was a little bit of a challenge, uh, just because we had never practiced that before, but it was... It went real well, so I, I guess the spacewalks are probably the highlight. Um, but uh, you know, close close second, I think, is just spending time up there with that crew. That was great. So are you looking forward to getting back home and uh, seeing your dog? Oh yeah, <laughs> I got pictures of him on his trip uh, to Houston. He was in the airplane with my sister and my dad. So um, I think he had a little traumatic day getting to Houston, and I'll have a little traumatic day getting to Houston. But we'll be happy together in our reunion. Welcome back. Thank you. Good luck.
Я здесь, здесь. Careful, watch out. Chkalovsky Airport. Yuri Ivanovich, we congratulate you on your successful expedition and we are happy to greet you here on Earth. Daddy, Daddy. Daddy, hello. Come give me a hug. Watch out, there is a bus behind you. Take the camera away. Let's go to the bus. Let's get on the bus. Daddy. In der kasachischen Steppe ist eine Soyuz-Kapsel mit drei Besatzungsmitgliedern der Internationalen Raumstation gelandet. Monatelang hatte das Team in 420 Kilometern Höhe die Erde umkreist. Jetzt ist die ISS nur noch zur Hälfte besetzt. Kurz vor Weihnachten sollen die nächsten Raumfahrer die Sechs-Mann-Station wieder komplett machen. Vier Monaten im Weltraum sind drei Crewmitglieder der Internationalen Raumstation ISS sicher auf die Erde zurückgekehrt. Ihre Soyuz-Kapsel wurde in der Nacht von der ISS abgekoppelt und landete bei Tagesanbruch in der verschneiten Steppe von Kasachstan. US-Astronautin Williams stellte mit ihrem Aufenthalt einen Rekord auf. Bisher war keine andere Frau über einen so langen Zeitraum, nämlich 127 Tage im All, wie sie. Thank you for a great handover, and I'm ready to assume command of the International Space Station. After handing over the reins of the International Space Station to NASA astronaut Kevin Ford, Expedition 33 Commander Sonny Williams of NASA, Soyuz Commander Yuri Malenchenko, and Flight Engineer Aki Hoshide of the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, all of whom have been on the station since July 17th, made a safe parachute-assisted landing in their Soyuz spacecraft in Kazakhstan on November 19th local time. Expedition 34 crew member Ford, Oleg Novitsky, and Evgeny Terelkin will be joined on board the station by Russian cosmonaut Roman Romanenko, NASA's Tom Marshburn, and Chris Hadfield of the Canadian Space Agency. Their arrival December 21st will restore to six the number of people aboard the orbiting laboratory.